Okay, are ready? All right, good evening and welcome to the East Line Board of Education for January 21st, uh, 2020. Uh, I'd like to call the meeting to order and for everyone who can rise, please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. At this point, uh, the board would be very glad to hear any comment from the public concerning any matter with the district. And um, if you could just, if you do have something to share with us, uh, try to keep your comments to around three minutes. So we can, uh, carry on. So, anybody would like to address the board at this time? Anybody? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, name and address. Okay. I'm Tracy Burns, and I am no, I, uh, yeah. in the math coach in the district, but I live in Mystic, so I am not a resident of these slide. And I would just like to, um, I'm here to support the proposed school budget for 2020, specifically hiring additional math coaches at the elementary level. Math coaches provide job embedded professional development focused on research based instructional strategies to improve teaching and student achievement. We currently have one math coach for three schools, 50 teachers, 829 elementary students. So that calculates to be about 36 minutes per week for each classroom, or about two minutes per child. I'm grateful for the improvements in our mathematics program that you have supported over the six years that I've worked in East Line. We adopted a primary mathematics resource for grades K through four, which helped us articulate what students need to learn at each grade level, and most importantly, what that learning looks like. This has helped build coherence across classrooms, across grades, and across schools. You have supported the development of common assessments, common professional development, and common conversations about mathematics <laughs> lessons at our PLCs and how to improve instruction. Our work continues, though. Mathematics is on the curriculum revision cycle next year, which will require time, expertise, and collaboration to rewrite curriculum in a digital format and identify supplemental resources to address gaps in student learning. We want to expand our impact. Just think what we will be able to accomplish with more math coaches. We want to accelerate student learning and provide more rigor and deeper connections so that students are ready for middle school mathematics and higher level math courses. We need to start early and give students a solid foundation. This is an investment in the students of East Line. A strong understanding of mathematics translates to college and career readiness. I am here on behalf of all of our elementary students, the ones rushing down the hall in the morning to get to their classroom so eager to learn. When was the last time you saw one of your co-workers skipping to their office? <laughs> we need to capitalize on this enthusiasm. Not only do we want to improve student learning for the students who are struggling the most, we want an exemplary mathematics program for all students in East Line. A mathematics program that challenges and encourages students to think logically, to understand and use numbers, and to persevere. In the words of John Hattie, author of 10 Mind Frames for Visible Learning, the prime purpose of education is to help students <laughs> exceed what they think is their potential, to see in students something that they may not see in themselves. Thank you for listening and for your continued support of our math program in East Line. Thank you, Tracy. Thanks, Tracy. Anybody, Anybody else like to address the board? board? Yes. yes. Hello, I'm Catherine L. I live at 9 Marion Drive. I'm also a teacher here in district at Haines School. I'm, I teach third grade. And I've been teaching there for about 11 years. Um, I'd like to speak to the Board of Ed tonight um, about the necessity of hiring a math coach for each elementary building. Um, as you proceed in the coming months, there will be a lot to consider. I urge you to make the decision to hire three math coaches at the elementary level. This is something that will directly affect students' learnings and boost the morale of the staff in your schools. My hope is that you will keep this at the forefront of your upcoming conversations and decision making. 
This has for too long been pushed to the side as a position that is not necessary. I'm here to tell you that we are no longer in a place in our schools to try and make do. It is imperative that students, teachers, and leaders at each building have one person whose sole job it is to be an expert in mathematics and particularly our curriculum and assessments in each line. There is no magic resource that has it all. Instead, there is highly trained personnel who know how to instruct and have learned through years of experience what is best for kids. This person would be able to tailor and differentiate instruction, provide pointed and meaningful teacher support for rigorous lessons, and to facilitate the instruction needed for students who require extra support in mathematics. This is such a necessity. Under our current plan, we have one math coach, Tracy Burns, who services all three elementary schools, as she said, and works on curriculum across the district. She is responsible for coaching the following numbers of general education teachers, 13 at Niantic Center, 15 teachers at Flanders, and 15 teachers at Haynes, and a total of 829 students, 829. I have not even gone into her job description with working with students who are at some of the most at-risk learners for math and additional support staff who work directly with kids. Ask yourself, do you think that you could effectively manage that many staff and have meaningful and pointed conversations with them? In addition to her duties for all three schools, she rolls out common assessments, plans professional learning, coordinates math program, and participates in professional learning communities about student data. This is an impossible job. Tracy has done her best and truly handled all of the responsibilities that she has with Grace. Quite honestly, I'm surprised that she has stayed the course with our district with what we're asking her to do. I would like to remind you that we have a literacy consultant at every school, and if you ask any teacher, they will tell you that language arts is much better off simply due to this fact. It runs smoothly, the process of getting kids extra help is easier and more supported, and that's due to the personnel. In fact, language arts consultants are now participating in a coaching model with classroom teachers, which is a luxury that we don't have in math. It should not be that way. It is lopsided and unfair, and this has continued for much too long. High curricular expectations, testing, and rigorous learning is something we deal with every day. When teachers have a child who is truly struggling with math, we have to fight for time with Tracy and try to make do the best we can with getting them the real support that they need. I'm tired of that standard. I'm frustrated that we have continued in this manner for so long, and I know that we can do better. I'm confident that we can select people for our buildings that will like. The beloved private math consultant, Terry Hurlbert, or Days Pass, can help teachers create instruction that goes beyond the basics, that will cater to children who are beyond the middle, and bolster tier one instruction in the classroom so that children can continue to get real time and just in time interventions to help them. So that when there is a difficulty with learning, we know that the classroom teacher has used all the tools that she possesses and has had consultation with the math coach and can now rely on that highly qualified individual to provide more intense instruction if needed, which will help ensure that they close the gaps in their learning or decide if they need a different plan of instruction. All this must happen with fidelity before a child can be recommended before special ed. Of all the decisions to be made, I encourage you to bring this one to the forefront. It is something that we lack compared to other districts and an absolute necessity in providing and upholding the quality of education that East Lyme is known for. I invite any of you at any time to come in and visit my classroom and see math instruction in action and what it looks like in real time. My door is always open, and I thank you for listening and hearing my comments. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Very good. Anybody else? Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Jamie Keith, and I live at 6 Mohawk Drive. Um, I'd like to address the board in regards to the topics of effective interventions, uh, reading curriculum, and special, special education in their relationship to the budget. And I would like to just, you know, praise you guys for what you do in that. I also think that that's a very um, important topic, and I fully agree with everything you said about needing more support in the areas of math. I'm going to address board's reading and special education. Um, at last week's Board of Education meeting, you were all provided with a copy of Emily Hanford's I Lost for Words article. I hope you've all taken the time to read the article or listen to the podcast. There 
there's a national conversation happening about the science of reading and how many students are being taught to be poor readers. Many schools are lacking a strong tier one phonics program that teaches students the foundation of reading and writing skills. I also hope you will analyze how the Eastline Public Schools are teaching reading and compare it as being implemented to the components of a strong, structured literacy approach. Additionally, I encourage you to look at how the district is providing explicit and systematic research-based interventions for the one in four students who are not proficient readers, as evidenced by recent SBAC scores. You may find yourself at a loss for words when you consider the 694 students or the one in four in this district who to ensure that they are proficient readers. I am a parent of one of the one in four students in your district who is not and has not been a proficient reader in all of her seven years in Eastland Public Schools. I'd like to briefly share parts of my daughter's journey in being one of the one in four in the district who is not a proficient reader. By the middle of kindergarten, my daughter was learning many of the necessary skills an early reader required to be proficient, but she needed a little boost of support and was referred for reading recovery for the second half of kindergarten. At the start of first grade, it was suggested that she participate in reading recovery program once again, and based on this program, she successfully met the exit criteria for reading recovery. However, she still was not proficient, and she was referred for a tiered inter intervention with a reading specialist. I'd like to ask the board um, administrators and literacy specialists to look at how many of our students successfully meet the criteria the exit criteria for reading recovery, yet continue to need some other type of intervention. I'm at a loss for words when I think of where my daughter would be if she spent that year in a more effective intervention that focused on foundational reading skills and strong phonics. Over the course of first and second grade, my daughter received a variety of pull-out interventions from special educators, reading specialists, and reading recovery instructors. My sweet little six and seven-year-old was eager to learn, yet continued to feel the pressures of not being a proficient reader. During these years, she was instructed and working through a homegrown spelling and phonics program, which never led to mastery or retention in any of the required phonics skills necessary for proficient reading and writing. Week after week, we studied and practiced spelling words and patterns, the class moved on, and she was left behind. I'm at a loss for words when I think about the difference a systematic and explicit tier one phonics approach would have made. By the end of second grade, my daughter was identified with a learning disability. We all recognized that she was an intelligent little girl that had weaknesses in areas that led to difficulties in reading and writing. She would re require specialized instruction and an individualized education plan in order to teach her to be a proficient, re proficient reader and writer. I would like to highlight that during her fourth grade year, she was able to work with a knowledgeable teacher, sitting in the room, um, who was trained in Orton Gillingham and structured word inquiry, um, and she made exceptional gains that year. Her confidence grew, and when the SBAC scores were reported for that one year, she was a proficient reader for this one year. Um, I, I personally don't think SBAC scores are the only way to show a reader is proficient or making gains, but I know that you as a district have to look at them. Um, and how your impacts of instruction affect student performance. My daughter's performance and success during this fourth grade year was directly related to being provided with appropriate interventions by an extensively trained teacher in a one-on-one -on -one setting. She has worked with numerous classroom teachers, special educators, and literacy specialists who are all <coughs> dedicated and doing their best to provide her with interventions and, and the instruction she needs However, without the appropriate training, certifications, and programs, they cannot teach her to be a proficient reader. I'm at a loss for my words when I think of where she would be if all of those dedicated teachers had the training, materials, and certifications to work with struggling readers. Unfortunately, districts are working with minimal budgets. I'm hopeful that the Board of Ed and Eastline Public Schools will scrutinize how an investment in training teachers in structured literacy, purchasing an explicit systematic phonics program for K-3, and training or hiring special educators who are extensively trained in this approach will save the district money in the long road and will benefit all students in the district on their path to becoming proficient in literacy. Research shows that structured literacy curriculum, which employs explicit <coughs> systematic phonics, is the most effective way to teach all children how to read. You'd be wise to invest in training for teachers and curriculum materials that are strongly aligned with this approach. Additionally, I'd like you to look at the resources and intervention programs in K-3 and see if these resources are leading to proficient readers. Finally, I urge you to increase or reallocate 
funding to the special education budget. These teachers are working with large caseloads. They have too many kids, and not all of them have the expertise to work with these kids. I'd like to add that I'm also speaking from the perspective of a certified elementary teacher. I've been employed in a pre-K through 8 school for the past 18 years. I've seen many shifts in curriculum and how we teach reading. And I can say in the past two years, our school worked um, to add a phonics program and three certified um, Orton Gillingham teachers. Um, our school felt we needed to be, do more to ensure all students are proficient readers, and I hope that East Lyme feels the same. On behalf of the one in four students in our district, thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, anybody else like this? Yes. Hi. My name is Melissa Hamilton, and I live at 55 Roxbury Road. Like Jamie, I would like to address the board tonight regarding the need for a structured literacy program in our schools. Um, I am aware that Ms. Dombrowski has presented you with research regarding structured literacy, including that of Emily Hanford, and I am in full support of all that she has shared with you. As stated in a podcast by the Reading League discussing the place of structured literacy in language arts education, quote, it's not phonics only, it's phonics early, and it's phonics really, really well, because that makes decoding work take up very little cognitive energy and frees up space for comprehension and critical thinking. This is something our students and our amazing teachers and special education teachers deserve. If our children are taught the structure of our language, allowing decoding to become second nature through this direct instruction, I believe we are making the jobs of our teachers easier, we can reduce the number of struggling readers, and we are creating a path to literacy success for our students that is wider than the path we currently follow. In the past few weeks, I have spoken to teachers from seven districts across the state, as well as others outside of state lines. I asked them this question, does your school use a structured literacy program? And if so, what are your feelings about its importance to the education of your students? Every single educator I spoke with worked for a district that uses a structured literacy program. That in itself <coughs> speaks volumes. As far as its importance, the comments I received included, it is critical, it is absolutely necessary, and this early work translates to advanced decoding and without it, many students struggle, either now or in the future. Of the teachers I spoke with, every single one deemed structured literacy an integral part of education. Um, this spoke directly to my own experiences as an educator as well. I am currently at home with my four children, um, but during the time I was teaching first grade in Clinton, Connecticut, I found the structured literacy program that was part of our curriculum at a tier one level to be necessary and helpful to students across the board, from the struggling readers to those that excel and everyone in between. I also found it very affirming to learn that a few years ago, Clinton schools actually chose to do away with the program they were using, essentially removing structured literacy from their curriculum. What they found in a very short time period was that this was a mistake. Um, they then re-employed their structured literacy program at the urgency of their teachers and are currently looking to upgrade their program for next year. Again, the necessity was clear. Of course, this information also speaks volumes to my own children. I currently have two children at Lily B. Haynes School with two more coming in the next few years. <coughs> I can certainly see how such a program would benefit not only my second grader, currently diagnosed with dyslexia, well below grade level in his language arts skills, and receiving services. He is the one in four that Jamie spoke about. But also my kindergartner who is above grade level. Since my son began school, I couldn't help but ask myself why our treasured East Lyme school system was missing this essential piece. I believe the addition of structured literacy to our curriculum can and will lead to greater success, not only for our children, but for our teachers who work tirelessly for the success of our children. And of course, will therefore have a positive impact on our budgetary needs in the future. On one more note, I would like to voice my support for training for special education teachers. In my own experiences, I have found there is a lack in training our teachers need and deserve in order to provide free, appropriate education for their learners. 
While the teachers are pleased to say that this training is, be is being pursued by the district and are hopeful that it will be in place soon, I have also heard concern as to whether this training was budget contingent. Please allow our special education teachers to do their job to the fullest, give them the training they deserve to service our students, including my own, and in turn reduce the number of families that feel the need to look at costly alternatives for the district for their children's education. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Anybody else like to address the board? Hi there, I'm Jill Johnson. I live at 234 Grassy Hole Road. Um, thank you for the opportunity to comment tonight. Um, I'd like to address the board about the budget, um, and I'd like to um, address the board about uh, the first grade teachers um, and the in I'm sorry, the incoming first graders. So um, this conversation has been going on for certainly a couple months. Um, the board has recognized in previous meetings, and I've read um, some meeting minutes um, regarding this issue about um, first grade teachers um, in the incoming year. I do recognize that while the discussion has um, continued, and I know that Amy Rogers um, had spoke last week, I read the meeting minutes and recognized that she spoke quite a bit about um, the size of the classrooms. I just want to voice my um, support for what she said last week as, as well as um, my support for all of the other um, you know, parents in this uh, district that may not have voiced their opinions here, but certainly um, it's been felt um, in the kindergarten um, at least in Flanders, I can't speak for the other schools, but I can say that I think um, the board needs to continue this conversation, and um, I certainly um, can appreciate everything that was said from um, other citizens tonight on the other topics, but I'd like to draw the attention to um, the, the class sizes. Um, I'd also like to, um, in addition to, you know, to that, is just to raise awareness of some STEM opportunities that have been occurring at Pfizer. So in years past, um, site affairs at Pfizer has not had the budget to support a lot of STEM activities. Um, 10, 15 years ago, this has been the case. Um, there's been new budget and new site affairs initiatives, and there's a lot of new opportunities for elementary, middle school, and high schoolers. Um, we've been bringing in quite a number of um, school districts, um, but East Lyme is not one of them. So I'd like to um, draw this to the board's attention that these are really great opportunities um, right in our backyard for kids to understand everything from statistics to medical writing, um, uh, from chemistry, biology, um, you name it. There is a job at Pfizer that is um, not just STEM, but also um, literacy based that I think um, the school district can um, take advantage of. Definitely. So thank, thank you, you for so much. Thank you. My name is Leah LaCara and I live at 17 South Washington Avenue. I would like to address the board in regards to the topics of literacy curriculum, special education, and how a structured literacy program is necessary for all students, not just those in interventions. Also, the relationship to these topics relative to the budget. I am sorry I couldn't be here tonight, but I wanted to share this. Since I feel the need for a structured literacy program is an urgent matter that needs to be addressed. This is a matter that affects my son and daughter, who attend Niantic Center School, as well as all the other students that are in and who will come through the schools within the district. One in four are in fact struggling readers that have not achieved proficiency according to the SBAC scores. 694 students at East Lyme Public Schools. I'm a, fo I'm a former elementary teacher and has had the experience of teaching for a short time in a district with structured literacy program in place and in one without. There was a big difference between the two schools. I felt far more confident in my instruction in the district where the structured literacy program was in place. It created an easy to follow and manageable way to harness the science of reading to teach students to read in the district without it, I felt like I wasn't really getting the phonics through the way it needed to be taught. I felt like my students weren't getting the basics of what they needed. I am also a parent of the one in four students in your district who is not a proficient reader. 
I'd like to share part of my son's experience because I feel there are so many similarities with other parents who are speaking out so eloquently for the need for a structured literacy program as well as more training and supports for our fabulous special education teachers. I registered my son for kindergarten when it became clear that he could not or was not interested in anything having to do with the alphabet or reading. I thought, oh, he's just an energetic boy and the research says that it benefits boys to give them more time to develop before sending them off to kindergarten. So he entered kindergarten at age six. Then in kindergarten, he just couldn't attend to his work tips of his pencils would break off because he put so much pressure on them. He couldn't get his work done. He could not litter, identify. His math skills were amazing though. I thought, maybe he's ADHD. He started crying regularly that he didn't want to go to school. He refused to go. There was a normal not wanting to go, but this was a severe, hysterical not wanting to go, beyond any anxiety I've ever seen exhibited before. He was referred to the reading program for first grade. He would master his spelling test and study so hard and put so much pressure on himself and then a week later he would retain zero of the spelling words. Then he was put on a 504 plan for attention related issues and received tier 3 intervention. He'd come home beyond emotionally spent. It became a worry to me that he would meet the exit criteria for tiered instruction and be back in the class without the literacy supports he so clearly needed. Second grade, his current year, he was identified with a specific learning disability. He requires specialized instruction and has an IEP in order to be a proficient reader and writer. His special education teacher has received Wilson training, however, she is not certified and has been through a level one structure of literacy provided by the CREC. I constantly worry and wonder if he's getting the phonics and decoding skills he needs to become a proficient reader. If he had received the structured literacy program from Kaon, I truly do not think we would be where we are today, which is with him learning first grade phonics skills during his pullouts, a year behind his peers. I truly believe he would know them by now had he had the structured and evidence-based literacy program from Kaon with explicit instruction. I urge the members of the Board of Education to allocate monies for evidence-based systematic phonics instruction program, whether it be a Wilson Foundations or a Morton Gillingham Tier 1 program that will align with the literacy curriculum district-wide, as well as align the instruction between special education teachers and the regular education teachers. I also feel that we need more Wilson certified, not just tra trained special education teachers at least one in each school certified. Many other high-performing schools in Connecticut have also already subscribed to providing systematic literacy programs with huge success. In order to be a top-notch school that delivers quality and comprehensive literacy instruction, we need to be providing our absolutely amazing teachers who we appreciate so much with the programs they need to provide quality, phonics-based instruction. Quality instruction would mean teaching more of the students to read at proficiency. Struggling readers will most likely go through the water cycle of interventions. Round and round they will go, they will get placed out for tier two or three supports, and likely there they will receive the systematic evidence-based approaches for a time. Then they will reach some kind of exit or target goal, and the teachers or the PPT will say, oh, they must be fixed now, and then back to the non-explicit tier one instruction go up and down on the intervention roller coaster. A speaker from the Reading League used the metaphor for this kind of experience as taking a shower, then going and putting dirty clothes back on after. Ultimately, these students will have reading struggles affect all areas of schooling, including math and science, writing and comprehension skills, and their mental and emotional well-being. As the budgets come up for review, I urge the Board of Education to consider funding a transformative change to the literacy program. It's not enough to add a layer of systematic explicit instruction to a tier one non-explicit literacy program. Let's front load the expense and likely have less special education resources used when a structured literacy program is in place. Ideally, students will be taught and getting evidence-based effective instruction that will not leave them guessing how to read. 
they will have the skills. Our fabulous teachers deserve to be provided with these materials, and so do our students, all of them, including the one and four. Thank you so much for your consideration of this important issue. Good. Thank you. Did you get the name and address? Good. Very good. Excellent. Anybody else like to address the board at this time? Yeah, Bonnie. Uh, my name is Bonnie Dombrowski. I live at 103 Walnut Hill Road. Um, if you don't mind me asking, um, by a show of hands, how many of you were able to read the article that I presented last week? That's no problem. Um, I have more copies <laughs> for you because I know I prefer to read things in, you know, in print than online. But um, And I know we're all super busy, so it's totally understandable. But Again, I'll just respectfully request that you read the article um, or listen to the 52-minute podcast. Um, it will shed tremendous light on the concerns that parents are raising here tonight about the one in four East Lyme students who are not proficient in English uh, language arts. The underlying research in the article explains the significant gap between what scientists know about how kids learn to read and what educators actually do to teach children to read. Three of the parents that you have heard from tonight are educators themselves. They have children who attend or have attended have attended Nyanic Center and Lily B. Haynes. My children attend Flanders. I'd ask you to consider the last time the board heard different parents from all three schools raising the same issue and asking for that issue to be addressed in the same way. We did not come here tonight to raise concerns about field trips or redistricting boundaries or which elementary school should be eliminated. It's not easy to speak in front of this board. It's especially not easy to publicly identify your child's struggles. So please know that the few of us here, in fact, represent many, many other families in the same boat with the same concerns. <coughs> to reiterate, the issue we are raising regarding reading instruction is not an issue with our teachers. We have incredibly talented, dedicated, and professional teachers and administrators across East Lyme. This is an issue with curriculum and training and how our district resources are being allocated and prioritized. I can understand why we want to allocate resources to the 57% of technology devices that have been sitting in East Lyme classrooms for more than six years. However, I ask you to consider that there are many students that have been sitting in East Lyme classrooms for more than six years and are still not proficient in ELA. And I can understand why some parents have a desire for global language teachers at the elementary level. Yet, how do we justify global language when many have not reached English language proficiency at the elementary level? Could we consider allocating those one and a half FTEs to bolster the staffing in first grade, which is a critical juncture for reading skill development? Could we look at the allocation of our intervention programs at each campus, such as reading recovery, and scrutinize them for effectiveness? If they are found to be lacking, as you heard from a couple different people tonight, to be prioritized funds for retraining and new curriculum and more effective reading intervention programs. It's not all bad news. There's good news tonight, too. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's lots of support available in Connecticut for our district. One of the parents here tonight reached out recently to Margie Gillis, founder of the nonprofit Literacy How, who was a tireless advocate and supporter of structured literacy adoption in our state and across the country. She asked Margie for examples of districts in Connecticut who have been most successful in implementing structured literacy. Margie responded that both Tolland and Stanford have been very receptive to the work of Literacy How, and in our area, Old Lyme has collaborated with their organization over the past 15 years. And I can't help but notice that Old Lyme leads the 13 area schools in SBAC testing for ELA. Margie Gillis herself volunteered to speak with administrators from East Lyme if they would like an introduction. And sometimes, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. So I want to ask if you guys could please take a look at this graphic. I have a lot of copies.
can see from the latter graphic on the left hand side, there's a depiction of how structured literacy can benefit all students at each level of reading proficiency. We can see from the cartoon on the right hand side why it makes so much sense to engage a solution that addresses our most vulnerable but helps every student. From conversations I've had with Mr. Newton and Ms. Brown, it sounds as though East Lyme is headed in the direction of engaging structured curriculum in our classrooms and bolstering our intervention resources. However, a firm commitment is imperative with an allocation of resources and a timeline to accompany that commitment. The wheels are beginning to turn, but I'd ask for the board's help to identify the sticking points and apply grease as needed. Because one in four East Lyme children don't have time to waste. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Very good. Anybody else like to address the board at this time? Any matter? Anybody? Mm -hmm. no? Okay, great. Excellent. Excellent. Oh, yes, yeah, sure. Hi. Um, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No. I'm Erin Nock. I'm the reading recovery teacher leader for the state of Connecticut. And um, I've been listening. I've attended a couple of forums, dyslexia forums, and I'm very aware of the argument out there for structured literacy. And I just want to clarify what reading recovery is and what reading recovery is not, because I heard it, it referenced um, in the conversation today. We're all out there to make children better readers. That's our goal. And I think, um, just to explain, reading recovery is a research-based, and it's affiliated with 30 universities um, around the United States and in um, Canada. And we have shown here in East Line to be extremely effective with reading recovery. So reading recovery is a 20-week short-term intervention plan for first grade readers only. And what we do is we invite the children in, you know, we, we, we select the 20% lowest children who are showing difficulty with alphabet recognition and phonetic awareness um, in reading. And from that, we select the children who are most at risk. We work with those children, and after 20 weeks, if we find that there are still significant concerns, we refer those children directly to special ed. Reading recovery is a vehicle that's supposed to help with early identification with children so that they get what they need quickly. What I'm hearing from people here is that we have uh, almost two concerns, a special ed concern where they feel the need to have more structured literacy within the special ed department, but we also have to consider what else we've heard here tonight, which is that the math specialist came up and said, wow, the literacy program programming is running like a well-oiled machine. We feel like right now the kids are getting what they need and we're effectively working to, to service what the kids need. It's almost like we have to look now, what do we do with the tier of children who aren't successful in reading recovery? And that's where I think our focus needs to go. Not so much as that reading recovery is broken. Reading recovery is doing what it's supposed to be doing, which is effectively addressing which kids need further intervention. Now, I am very sympathetic for children who do get caught up and who do not get what they need um, over the course of time. But reading recovery has effectively worked within this um, school district for many, many years. We had it for, I think, over 20, 20, over 20 years. And um, it's been, very, we have a 75% success rate or higher. It fluctuates between 75 and 80% to make sure that those, the, that group of children continues on to make successful regular ed gains. It's the other percentage that we need to look at a little bit more closely. But to service all children with the structured literacy that's as intensive would be something that I would caution you to look a little more deeply at. I have, I have a Wilson book with me today. I actually am Wilson certified as well. The district that I work in, we have both the Wilson 
prog um, program and we have reading recovery. We work together with our special ed department to ensure every child gets exactly what they need. But we don't want to strip away from the district, which is already working, something that um, is scientifically based, affiliated with Lesley University currently right now. The teachers get ongoing, continuous training every month um, with the newest data and research to improve reading instruction. We don't want to take this gem of a resource away from this district because it has made such a powerful impact on, the, on many children. We're hearing the other side of it, which is important, but I think we need to work together to make all sure all children learn to read, and we don't over-identify or put children in special ed who do not need to be in special ed at six years old. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you have your name? I'm sorry. My name is Erin Knock. Erin Knock. And do you have a business card? I can make one. Point of order. Point of order. I'm sorry. To help Just your address, please. I'm 359 Pine Lane. I'm from Weathersfields, Connecticut. I work in Farmington, but I'm the teacher leader. And I apologize if I was a little. No, that's okay. I just wanted to make sure that we that for the record. Shortly that this meeting was happening. But I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else want to address the board at, at this time? Anybody else? May I just comment to what? Uh, no. Let, let's. Yeah. Um, let's try not to have a uh, debate. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. So with that, uh, we will move on. Uh, we have no. Uh, we have some minutes for approval. We have minutes from our January thirteenth uh, meeting, um, which was a regular scheduled meeting. Anybody like to make a motion on those? I'd like to make a motion to approve the minutes from the January thirteenth regularly scheduled meeting. I second. Okay. Second. Any, any corrections, adjustments to those minutes? No? Okay, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Lee abstains. Those are approved. We do not have any special reports for this evening. Uh, so that will take us right into our discussion items for the evening. And the, the big one, obviously, is uh, the discussion of the superintendent's proposed uh, budget for uh, 20 uh, 20, 2021. 20, and um, we heard last week, we heard uh, the superintendent presented. Um, the budget was very good, good presentation. Uh, and, um, but we uh, basically held off on opening, opening the floor for discussions. So. Uh, oh, yeah, that's okay. actually for the public. That's all oh. Yeah, no, no sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. Mike Fulton, Jack. Yeah. yeah. You all have this in board decks. I just want to make sure we had enough some copies for the public. Um, so this is um, now an opportunity for us to uh, have discussions uh, about any aspects or all parts of the budget. And Jeff, I'll yeah, turn it over to you. For well, why don't we just quickly recap for those who you know might not have been here, unless they're been here. We are um, currently looking at two parts to this uh, this budget: operating budget and then a technology component. Um, so for those at home and community, uh, we're looking at. Uh, over the current fiscal year, a 4.26 proposed or uh, recommended increase, um, which we outlined and went through uh, components of that at the last meeting. The other component is a 1.89% uh, in technology that we want to go through the acquisition plan, uh, which is part of the town you know, capital improvement bond, okay. et cetera. Separate and not in the operating budget, but just to clarify the materials, again, that received the Board of Ed, um, the bottom line number shows those two combined in your papers. Just want to be clear for the public. If anybody gets a hold of those documents, they're all public documents. Um, so we're really looking at those two pieces. We kind of want to keep those separate tonight as well. First talk about the 4.26% and um, some of our repurposing and the document that we had uh, attached to board document this afternoon. We're still working on it today. We're going to go through that. And that's what we got that we just kind of passed out. Um, so the public could see that too. Um, and then we'll talk about technology, and I know some of you have comments on both. Uh, and Barry's got some points on technology as well that he wanted to share. But if we could reference that document that you have in board docs, if you call it the prioritized initiative needs a draft. Um, and I want to preface this as draft. Look, everything is important um, when it comes to you know, students. Uh, and, and we hear that. We're hearing that you know, tonight. Um, there's a lot of passion for everything. Bottom line, when it comes down to you know, number one, and, and the feedback, most feedback that we receive is class size. Uh, and working uh, better to keep our class sizes 
uh, lower. So one element, um, and again, anybody can prioritize this list. We kind of put them in priority order based off of the feedback that we received. The elementary teachers, so I'm looking at the left at the uh, salaries. Uh, and again, these are not currently included in that 4.26. So I'm going to preface that again. We're trying to repurpose um, to bring some of these into the, into the, the budget for next year at uh, little to no cost. Um, the elementary teacher at Niantic Center, Niantic Center currently has uh, two grade levels that have two teachers and three teachers um, at uh, three of the grade levels. So with the movement of classes going up the next year, there, when it all, you shake it all out, there's a need for an additional elementary teacher to make sure the class size remain the same as we want them. Um, I want to jump down just to kindergarten and put that out there because there's a lot of talk about kindergarten for Lily Haynes and, and Flanders. We added a kindergarten uh, teacher at Niagara Center this year. We did not at the other two schools. When we went back, and we talked about this, about next year trying to get this into the budget, but when we went back and looked at all the research on the birth trends, um, Lona McBrooms, I even pulled up NASDAQs, uh, the kindergarten numbers are significantly lower. The birth rates five years ago, significantly lower going into next year than they were this year. Um, NESDEC has it 36 students lower, uh, kindergartners that would join us. Uh, Nolan McBroom has 28 students. And they're pretty much spot on with the number this year. We have 168 kindergartners this year across the three schools. And they projected around 169. So they're pretty close. So if we live to the data um, that's before us, we should have significantly lower kindergarten numbers coming in next year. So my recommendation there would be uh, to hold. And as we get into the summer, we need to add kindergarten teachers. We do it sooner than we talked about you know, last summer. Um, but the numbers are supposed to be lower. So I just want to put that out there for you know, further discussion. You can kind of see from the chart. I won't go specifically through every one of these. We can talk about each one of them as we move forward. But the social worker and the BCBA, um, those are really student-based um, and really needed. We don't want to lose the current one BCBA that we have because she's sitting with a caseload of 46. Uh, we don't want her to go elsewhere. Um, she's done a great job, and we want to keep that individual in district. Uh, the math coaches, we heard uh, a little bit of information you know, this evening. I feel this is the year to do it, um, to bring them in you know, to support our teachers and support our kids uh, in the area of math. Um, we'll talk more about that one um, as we get into this global language. Quick overview, I mean, we did our survey this past summer. Uh, we can repurpose for one teacher you know, from the middle school. Uh, remember that bubble is going through the middle school right now, so there's less students at that middle school level. Not to say in two, three, four years down the road that the numbers are going to be higher and there will be a need you know, to increase. We, we can make it work to have one less global language teacher at the middle school to bring down to the elementary uh, level. So that's a possibility there. We still, um, and we're talking about funding the other 0.5 with maybe some possible reductions and shifting in some lunch and recess aids. And then the instructional technology manager, we can talk you know, more about that. We don't have any funding currently to that. So when you shake this all out, we shared with you a 500 and almost a $600,000 increase that was not in the budget. That's over an additional percent to the 4.26. We brought that down with repurposing to about 130 thousand nine hundred and thirty dollars which would be if you added that into the budget a four point five three rather than a four point two six um, so wanted to put that out for discussion first and uh, I like to talk about those components and then we move into technology <coughs> comments my question is right, where's the 1.89 where's that conversation at if we want to try to with the technology yeah that is over we've talked to the town um i know mark nickerson had, uh, had left um uh, last meeting yeah. before we had a chance to talk about that but we met with uh, anna johnson the finance director um they're on board with doing that it's just we're just waiting back for information from anna johnson in relation to the bonding and how many years <coughs> it would be where we would pay that back Correct. so we borrow the money up front uh, it equates out to nine hundred and twenty seven thousand yeah. for the, the technology mm -hmm. the infrastructure uh, and the, the mobile learning devices um, and we pay that back over five to ten years so that's how that would work. Same thing we do with our acquisition plan right now through the town. Now, is that something that has to be voted on by the Board of Finance? Yes. yes. Separately. Yes. It has to be separate. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's part of the, part of the it's capital. It's part of the capital budget, but yes, it would be voted on. So it doesn't have to be voted on in order to, for it to enter the capital improvement, or no? It would have to be approved by the Board of Finance in order for them to proceed with the acquisition. Got it. 
a question. So you're saying the town's making that payment, it'll come out of the town budget? Nope. We make that payment back to them. Oh, it's like buy, it's like uh, leasing a car, buying a yeah. car. Right. Yep. We're we're buying it up front, nine hundred and twenty seven thousand, all the all the, the stuff we need, and then we're gonna pay that back. As part of the town's that's, capital that's how for the last five years we've been replenishing our devices. Right. Yes. Is, is okay. through an acquisition exactly. program. Exactly. And, and so yeah. It'd just be a bigger a bigger purchase. A bigger chunk. Yes. Bigger purchase. Yeah. Much, yeah. yeah. Triple the chunk. Jeff, did, when, when that was presented, was it presented with the reality that, that in another five or six years we're, we're going to be doing the same thing again? They're, they, they're not under the impression that this is a fix that is not going to come. This is going to be an ongoing thing is that was that clear to them I think so because we mm -hmm. kept it yeah, yeah infrastructure yeah, versus so. devices infrastructure you have a longer waiting period of when we need to replace versus the the mobile learning devices okay. um, which will be sooner yeah, they're gonna be four or five years mm -hmm. so yes we did grow so, okay mm -hmm. with, with with mark with the first Lackman as well as um, Anna Johnson so we haven't talked to the Board of Finance at all about this and and the question um, I had about the looking at the new initiatives that here um, something was mentioned tonight. We ended up going forward with uh, not hiring additional kindergarten teachers this year. So we've got this bubble of a larger class sizes. Is, is is that going to be resolved in some other way when they move to first grade, or are we still going to be looking at big class sizes well, in the first grade? First grade is pretty much at some of those numbers now, um, and we've added we added paraprofessionals to help. Offset and, and gain support. So first grade is pretty large too. So first grade right now, Nyanic Center currently sitting at 17.7, Louis uh, Haines 20, and Flanders 17.3. And what's moving into them so, from Flanders? Um, so from Flanders 20, uh, I, this is average. Um, the Libby Haines 20 and Nyanic Center 15.3 because we added that uh, you know, the third teacher um, there. So, but again, we, we brought on the six paraprofessionals. One of our recommendations was, you know, we, we said a reduction of three of those six, but use the other three to continue to help support. And that, that could be in first grade. Remember the universal design we were talking about, too, with trying to have every ca uh, classroom, K uh, and one, has a designated uh, paraprofessional in the room at all, all times. It was one of our goals in all of this, too, to provide additional support. Um, especially at that primary level. I mean, that, that's the time to catch them, um, students. Correct, but our, our class size guidelines, I don't believe, were 20 for kindergarten and first grade. No, and essentially by letting this go this year and again next year, we're kind of establishing a trend that 20 is the new number that we're happy with for right. first and kindergarten and first grade, and I'm not, it's not. comfortable with that. We're all right, right there. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I, don't, I don't disagree at all. Um, I can actually share, share this. I've got this document so you can look at all the numbers. So you have them. So this is current, uh, current numbers. Oh. <coughs> you're, no, you're absolutely right. And, and it's, we went against the grain. Um, <coughs> I'll let the dollars talk more than. I think you know we were hoping that the numbers wouldn't climb. Uh, I don't want to gamble again, uh, especially at the K level. I think you know we need to make that decision to pull the trigger on adding an additional teacher earlier in the summer if it gets anywhere. I, I agree, so, but I kind of feel like there there needs to be a little bit of makeup to let that same group be in large class sizes, kind of throughout their early years. Is you know, maybe there's an opportunity to make up a little bit. I, I don't know. I'm just what would your thought be to, to recommend? Uh, no, I, I just I, I. It's kind of like, oh, my kid started in the bubble yeah, year, so they're stuck with large class sizes through their whole experience, and I don't, I don't. No, I'm with you. I think they kind of got the short end of the stick, so to speak. Okay. Better, yeah. better to keep your kid out for a year or whatever and join the. Stay back a year and do it over again. Yeah, it, the the numbers are uh, they are higher. I mean, it's speaking to having you know more kids, you know, in, in district, which is good, um, or at least not declining in enrollment. But yet, we 
you either got to add teachers in then or? Uh, I mean, we, uh, so. a few years ago, we're sitting here talking about uh, ideal numbers that we wanted for our classrooms. And, yeah, we and I think we're not trying to live to the numbers that we talked about. I, can, I can't say enough about that. I mean, we put it in place for a reason. Mm -hmm. And I remember yeah. <laughs> how controversial it was. It's something that I wanted. You know, and we we made that commitment as a district, and it is it definitely does get hard because you can't foresee the numbers, and then they start coming in, and then it's you know, do you hire, do you not? I think that I know the majority has said hire. This past round, you went back and you talked to the teachers and you gave them a choice. We did, and the teachers, right. yeah, at Flanders, uh, and right. uh, but that choice was late in the game too. Yeah, though. It, it was wasn't early. Right. It was already it a couple was. weeks into the school year. It was. Um, you know, we did some added a TA, you know, at Flanders too, which is a little, you know, one step above an IA um, to kind of split one of those classes that had. Uh, so, and, and again, you could have a class of, of seventeen okay. students and a class of twenty students or twenty-one students. The makeup too of what you yeah. have. Yeah, exactly. No, no, no needs there's no doubt about yeah. that. Yeah. But yeah. with, so. with with the renovation, we some of the classrooms are not quite as big as what they were, and now we've got twenty kids in a room, and what that makes a big difference you know. too. Flanders has smaller classrooms. Haynes had has much bigger classrooms, and nine except kind of in the middle. Jeff, Jeff, so. I was just thinking, maybe I can just say maybe what we should see then is a projection based on this information as to what the class sizes. The elementary level are going to be both our best guess is what they're going to be for next year, and not the average num average class size, but actually, the, if you got three classes, they're going to have th three classes, and here's the number of kids in each one of those in each one of those classes. Mm -hmm. So everybody can everybody can see that, um, uh, and I, I think that that would that would help the, the the conversation. I when I sat back and and sat down and this this afternoon and looked at the at the list and then wrote down my thoughts on priority. The first priority came I, I it was just like what Candace said, class size. Mm -hmm. We gotta make sure we get that we get we get that right because I think it, that that's just that's just so so high and we, and I know we've been we've been working we've been right on that bubble yeah. um, with the kindergarten one. So I, I would think that I would think having a sheet that says here's what it could look like if we don't add any more, and then here's the best, here's what we could do if we had to add some more, and this is what the numbers would start to look like. So, so the board can, can, can easily, easily see that, and then, and then talk about if we were to make an adjustment uh, with staffing to address class size, this is how many people we would be talking about. And not knowing who's you know, moving in or moving right. out, you know, um, I mean, Lily Behanes and Flanders all have three teachers at every grade level. Yep. So it's easy to say next year, grade one to two is going to have the, that same number. But mm -hmm. Nine Center was the tricky one, and that's yeah. why we added, we were looking to add a teacher yep. there because yep. the shuffling. Yep. Yeah. I just wanted to add, too, because the birth, um, I understand the numbers, and I, I get the data. But you can't always go by that, and we've right. said that a million times, you right? Can. And I mean, you it's, can. all it's I can say they were usually, spot on this usually you know, strong, for this usually year. Right. Um, but <laughs> we have a, a very large rental base here uh, mm -hmm. in East Lyme and Nyanic, and those yeah. numbers skyrocket. We have lots right. of people that transfer to our town because of jobs, and that's where you <clears> see <throat> the increases. So I mean, we can we can document and we can keep the data to kind of give us an idea. But there's a lot of movement um, in our district, and let's face it: the more lists we make, and I mean, we are—we're a hot commodity. I know that there are people that are leaving the state of Connecticut. I'm not blind to the news, but we—we we are growing, and we just had Mark Nickerson here the other week mm -hmm. talking about, I want to say, five or six considerably large developments. Only one retirement, Jamie. Do you remember? I wrote it down. Um, but it was one. It was two, a lot. Three four, five, six, and one of them is senior. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I say stay true to our commitment that we put into place. And Look, I am more than happy to add additional teachers, I, you know, you know recommend I, additional teachers in. You know, I, I'm, yeah. I'm just trying to balance a, a higher number already with, you know, but if we as a, a board and administration, absolutely, <laughs> I'm all for it. Um, and fighting that good fight, you know, downtown yeah. to get what we <laughs> yeah. need. Yeah. Uh, say the word, and well, we'll put them in. Eric, you got your hand up. Yeah, 
I'm going to have a future questions about other topics, but just on this one, I just want to clarify. So the additional elementary teacher that's in here for Niantic Center yeah. is for which, is for what? Because if, if you look at Niantic Center, see yeah. how you've got K as three. Yeah, three, 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 three two, two, three, two. Yeah. When you shake all that out and having to, when, when a, like grade two goes up to grade three, um, and then grade three goes to grade four, when you shake that out, there is a need for one additional teacher to make sure okay. um, one okay. of the grade levels because doesn't have too many. Fourth grade things. is only two. Exactly. So and that graduates, or moves right. on. Exactly. So we and we so what that would in, by adding one, we're projecting three for kindergarten for that for this budget year. Yes, we left three in. Yeah. Okay. So but, so technically we if. Well, if we went back and didn't bring forth kindergarten teachers, you could take one kindergarten teacher out, which would then eliminate the need for that one additional teacher at the higher grade levels at Niantic Center. <coughs> yeah. But again, all of that is we're gambling yeah. on all of you know all, yeah. all of that so, sort of thing. I, I you know and so I think I'm you know, thinking hard about this one. Uh, I'll be honest. Uh, the four point, you know, I'm the finance guy, right? So four point two six already has me concerned, and I have a question about that because I'm a little worried it might even be a little higher than that. But let's just say four point two six. Um, and I look at all these other things, which has a lot of uh, good stuff. It has me concerned, but I, I, I think where I'm falling on this is an agreement with Bill and Candace that. Um, I feel like Lily B in Flanders kindergarten was last minute, and I think the reason they made the decision they did was they thought it'd be more disruptive adding a right. teacher, separating classes, and doing all that stuff yeah. than it was that 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 this was the right decision to make. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and Niantic Center thought it was not going to be as disruptive, right? So it was just different philosophies on how do you solve this here. So I'm, I'm I, I would. I'm in favor of um, adding, and I, I worry, I think as Candace was saying, about betting on what's going to happen with the kindergarten. I'd rather put it in, and if we don't need them, you know, there's other things on this list. Look, we're not going to be able to fund everything, right? We're already, we're already at a big number. We know that the Board of Finance is going to challenge whatever number we have. So... Some of these things, while they all have merits, some of these are going to fall off in what we can fund. And if we decide on kindergarten teachers, which will keep, let's say, keep them at like 15 to 16 to 17 in each kindergarten class, and it ends up that we just have lower enrollment, we can either redirect those funds or, in theory, give them back to the town or not spend it, whatever. We can, we can figure out what to do with it, but I think... I, I know we got to make an earlier decision, but it'll be after the budget is final. I, I'd rather I'd rather put it all in um, right up front. Or work to provide more support to grade one. Yeah. yeah you know, both. No, both. I, no. I'd like to have. No. Oh, oh. I'd like to have two more at grade one. Yeah. yeah. Right. Because we need one for Flanders and one for Lily B. Mm -hmm. And then I'd like to have. Also, an extra K at Flanders and Lily B. So you're talking four, four, four total teachers. Yeah, that would be my view. Um, but it's going to impact all these other things. Um, but I think that's our foundation. Right. You know, the way I the way I see it is is that ever since Jeff's been here, or maybe yeah, I think four four or five years, we have come in bare bones with nothing added. Yeah, <laughs> and we yep. have fought to keep yep. class sizes where yeah. they're at. So yep. okay, and every year we've gone to the town and they and they randomly, and I'd say last year was a, was was we got caught, <laughs> they hacked we got we, we got whacked. Yep. Um, so we had eighty five gazillion people come to the middle yep. school and give speeches, and they gave us back some of some of the money, but not all the money yep. we were asking for. I. I kind of have this feeling that this year, I, maybe what we should be doing is saying, look, here's the money we need to keep where we're at. Yeah. If that needs more teachers because our yeah. class sizes have, have, yeah. have crept up, then so yeah. be it. Yeah. And this is the year that we should. We said, look, look we've, we've worked very hard to keep the numbers as low as we can. 
and we have we have deferred adding math coaches. Um, we've deferred adding some other things and so yep. forth over the years, yep. and we think this is the year that, that we're we're not we're gonna we're asking yep. for it. So yep. and I, you know, it's, it's tough, but I mean, I don't know how else you how I, else you do it. Do I, it. I agree. I mean, I think. I mean, for me, our baseline you got was it Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Mm -hmm. Is class size is the foundation. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, that's our starting point, and that's what we've talked about, right? We've talked about all the times that I've been on the board, my learning and education mm -hmm. from everybody else, is that's the foundation. And if we get that right, then we can sort out everything else. But if that's wrong, all these other things we put in place um, tend to start falling apart. So that's... That's where I think I think it's four. Well, five with the one we already are asking for in Niantic, so it's four more, um, which I know it's a lot, but I I think that's our foundation. And in theory, if there's more students in the schools, it's because there's more development in our town, which means that there's more tax dollars in theory on our grand list. And I, I know it's more complicated than that, but I mean, if you kind of say one leads to another and it's not perfect, in theory there are dollars. So that's our foundation. Um, so I'll stop talking. But that that's my that's a good point. thinking on that. Absolutely. Please. Yeah, I just want to like say. I'm in full agreement with prioritizing adding additional teachers. I know we have really talented paraprofessionals who stepped up and have been supporting in an excellent way this year. I still just don't think it's a substitute for smaller class sizes. And we've been pushing this guidance that we have set what, two years ago now, every year. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last thing I'll say is I also, it just feels weird to me to defer or push back math coaches again. I know that's been a huge topic of yeah, conversation. I agree. I agree. And that's why I'm to prioritize that. Yeah. So um, I, think, I think we need to keep our eye on that this year as well. Yeah. I think Tracy said it very well that, that <coughs> it's every year we've been talking about how many years have we been talking about math? This has been three four. Yeah, I think it's three, three, or, three or four. Three or four. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's, um, it's not right. It's not right. And, it, and it's, uh, it, it's not right to the staff either. Um, so. Three. Okay, also related to class size is the what are we accomplishing by decreasing class size? And I think the figure that stands out there for me is on the uh, accountability index for the state. The growth, the, the growth target for all our students is like uh, they set you know, growth targets in English, language arts, and math. And, um, that each student is supposed to achieve a certain growth each year. We're only hitting 65% of that target. Right. Mm -hmm. you know, and so one of the reasons we're doing that is because of class size. So added to the fact, so we go forward to the, the, uh, the finance board, we just saying that we need smart classes because smart classes are good. I think we should add the rationale that the reason we need smaller classes is because we're trying to address the fact that only 65% of our students are achieving the growth index in the current system. Good. Very well said. Yeah, and I think well to, come, to back, piggyback on it, it's even lower. If you look at the high needs population, which is your students that classify as ELL, special education, and or free and reduced lunch, it's only 58. Yeah. And really, if you look at class size research, though that population is where some of the research has supported that, is especially for those levels of students and getting them to grow. So I think it'd be a good... Both points would be good. Good, yeah, good yeah. point, Jamie. So I'm not going to reiterate what everyone has said about class sizes because I think as a board we've all stood very strong behind the fact that we support the small class sizes, which is why we were so concerned at the beginning of this year. Um, but with that said, I um, am concerned about the social worker piece because um, I know that our current social workers are highly overworked. Um, but I also know that our drug and alcohol counselor, we could use a lot more hours for him because he's only here, what, three days a week. And he, I know he has a packed schedule. Um, and I know that we have had a lot of incidents in our community on overdosing and everything else and I would like to see more hours given to him or someone else um, in the drug and alcohol aspect of it 
Um, I know that we've talked. I've we've talked as a coalition with Park and Rec, and they're going to try to give us money. Yeah. Um, but the board of finance always cuts their drug and alcohol dollars. They do. Um, because they don't see it as a need in our community. Um, <laughs> but it is. Um, we have a lot of students who suffer. We have a lot of parents who suffer, and that trickles down to the students also. Um, and that affects their work in school because if they're having issues at home, we all know they're not learning. Um, so I would like to make sure that we keep that aspect in here because it's very, very needed and no one's talked about it. But um, I do know that they're very, very overworked. They have high caseloads. Um, and they're trying their best to help our students and families. Mm -hmm. Part of we had that additional social mm -hmm. worker, it could take some of that pain mm -hmm. off of, you know, the uh, drug and alcohol as well, or work in tandem. But I know he's got an open door policy, but I know yeah. someone's always in there, yeah. mm -hmm. so it doesn't help if you have an open door policy yeah. if your door's always shut with someone in it. Yep. Yep. Eric, you had your hand back. So sorry, I have four different items. So I'm happy to do a couple and then let others talk and then do a couple more. So however you want to do it. So first thing, I just want to make sure that our 4.26 is right. So Mariana, this might be a question for you. When we do the technology increase, right. we're going to get charged for one fifth, one eighth, some right. one something of that. Is right. that in our 4.26? And we need to add that back. Okay. If that's so, what happens. so we're starting point just so everybody is higher than that. Whatever that we don't know what that number will be. Probably be like like a, somewhere greater than a hundred thousand, less than two hundred. About two. It would be about two hundred. It'd be between one seventy-five and two hundred thousand, assuming an right. interest rate of two and a half percent. Forty-six thousand. Right what, what over what and the length of the loan? Um, so that's what we're, I'm waiting to find yeah. out. It's either going to be so the mobile devices will definitely be over five years because that's their life. Yep. It's the infrastructure. Yeah. Um, we're thinking the life is seven years. So she's checking with the financing okay. company just to see if it's something they can do over seven. Good point. Can I just so. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, but hold that. Write that down. <laughs> so, so I think it'd be good to know what number that is, but it's something that, that we just have to be aware of, right? Okay. So then um, I just want to comment on the, the math coaches because I think everyone up here is in agreement that there's this need. I think I have a different viewpoint on how to solve that problem. And maybe it's that I don't understand. I thought I understood what the purpose of the math coaches is, but I, you know, from a hearing, maybe I'm hearing different. So what I thought it was that the math coaches are really for the, and maybe one of the elementary principals can help, was really to help the teachers so that they can learn to better instruct from <coughs> math at an elementary school basis. And it's not, or it's not, or it's rare to have coach to student, that it's really coach to teacher interactions. So I just want to make sure because when given met hearing metrics of we have you know 829 or whatever students, is that the right metric or is the metric how many teachers do we have? And and the reason I say that is my I need to understand that before I comment on what my thought of how the solution would go. So can we get clarity? Is it is it Coach to teacher, or is it coach to student? We all go up. Yeah, Tracy. <laughs> we all go up. Uh, uh, Melissa had a last week. So let me start that with Linda funny. and Tracy's here as well. Tracy, go ahead. Yeah. Come, come on up, Tracy. I'm not supporting you. I like to. <laughs> so I like to use the analogy, and, and we did this at the last faculty meeting, of, of sport, a sports coach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you take a sports coach and you're coaching the team. Yep. Even though you're helping individual teachers here and there, you're still, you are still coaching the team to, for its achievement of getting goals and yeah, winning yeah. And, and having players. But, so who does the coach meet with? Do they meet with the teachers or students or so, both? Or uh, it's a 70-30 break. So 30% of their job, and we happen to have a language arts too, actually here. <laughs> Um, so they can speak as well. I know, it's just No, please do. Um, 
30% of the time is for uh, tier support and actually working with children, working with the teachers and working with children that do have those academic needs of okay. language arts or math needs. Okay. But uh, the other 70% in a true coaching model, is, it really is supporting the teachers yeah. and uh, being able to um, help them with uh, best practice instruction yeah. Yeah. for the whole class for tier one. So what we're talking about really is is really looking at that uh, tier one support, as uh, parents were saying, to really help those teachers with a, a structured literacy approach in the classroom yep. so that kids can um, get the support that they need prior to them you know, having um, any issues. So it's really to help coach the teachers so that it trickles down to, yep. the, to the students yep. so that there's consistency across the board too. Job embedded, so they're working right with those teachers in their classroom will go, it's a cycle of maybe, I don't know how many weeks of the cycles are, it can vary, but they'll literally go in, work with the teacher, watch the teacher, or model with them um, in instruction, and then um, you know, release it to the, to the teachers. It's very, it's very powerful. Very yeah, powerful. So, so I think you guys have educated me and us, you know, in terms of, I understand, you know, an el elementary school teacher is has to be kind of a jack of all trades in general, has to know a whole bunch of things. So it's really hard, right? So I completely get that. Different than as you go to middle school and, and high school where you're more specialized in probably your perfect, you know, what you, you went to school for in a specific area. So we have all these math teachers, and I brought this up before, so it's not like, we have all these math teachers at the high school and the middle school who that's their specialty. Isn't there a way that we can utilize that group using stipends or something, so we obviously would pay them for that service, but to help coach and teach the teachers. So the, the student piece, that doesn't solve the student piece. They're not gonna have time to do so that 30%, and I have to think through. But for that 70% where it's you know coach to teacher, can't some of, we have some great math teachers in the middle school and high school, so can't they, you know, after, you know, school ends at 2 o'clock here, can't they then go spend time with the teacher? I'm not sure how that would work logistically, but yeah. isn't it's, it? It's, it's throughout the day. It's ongoing. It's, like I said, it's job embedded to come at 2 o'clock or 2.30. Um, is, you know, I can't, I can't even visualize what, what that would look like. I mean, we have a set schedule. There's uh, not every grade level teaches math at the same time but uh, they're experts in their field at that level. Um, and so if you um, want to hone in on what the essential skills are at the elementary level, then you know, we need people who, who are going to be able to work at that level and know what the curriculum is and, and what best practice instruction is for those teachers. Uh, so if, if you think of a triangle, this is how we talk about it, sort of multi-tiered system of support, and you have that tier one instructional model, yeah. A kid, if they're not successful in that explicit tier one model, gets moved to a tier two model. What we want to commit to as a district is that when they move to a separate tier, they get an even more qualified adult, not a less qualified adult. So that we try to close in the gap at tier two before they get moved to a tier three so that our professional skill set is advanced and more targeted as kids move through the tiered system. What we're noticing right now is that those at tier one are sort of going, okay, I don't have that more qualified person technically, or I might need to advance my teaching skill set because this is beyond the general ed curriculum I'm offer. Now I'm a service provider to these 15 students because they need targeted math skill-based instruction. I'm now a service provider, and if that isn't deemed successful, they move to a tier three, which should be another qualified person. And at the elementary level for mathematics, they're going, okay, wait, that's one person across three schools. So I think that's part of the model that we're trying to embrace is that we want a really strong tier one. So we have less kids moving to tier two and less kids moving to tier three. And right now, sometimes our habit is we have tier one and then when kids need tier two, 
we might have them work with a paraprofessional, yeah. but we're now giving you a less qualified adult than you had even in tier one. And I think we were so that's more part of what we need to yes. than proactive. Yes. We're working on those kids who are already struggling. Right. And that's not that's not working with all of our children so that we don't get to that point. So right. who's doing tier two? So right now, depending on for mathematics, it could be a paraprofessional, it could be a general education teacher if they're providing small so groups. So the kids are taken out of the And room. Tracy, God bless her, is overseeing yeah, the true. learning plans of all Tier 2 yeah. kids with the paraprofessionals and assisting in writing with those plans. So a Tier 2 is a one-on-one? -on -one. It yeah. could be one-on-one, -on -one, but it's a targeted, it's a, I'm providing this instruction right now on fractions, I'm two weeks into it. This student is looking at me like they are completely lost. I've pulled them small group here on one day. I pulled them another group. They are not with me. I'm now questioning their number sense overall and their base 10 understanding. As I look back and look at the assessment, I'm going, whoa, there's a couple numeracy gaps here. Okay. I now need to move them to two because I need to dip in for six weeks, teach some explicit numeracy lessons beyond the core instruction that they're getting. And then hopefully, right, we've done our due diligence in a six to eight week cycle because we don't want the kid living in that tier. So two, we want them to come back to tier so two one. Two to three, two to th level of tier two and three are individual one on one services. They could be, they could be small group. It all depends on what it is the skill needs. So is the and teacher doing the teacher in the classroom doing the doing the small group? Yes, for the most part. Yep. So she pulls those kids out and leaves the rest of the kids doing whatever she assignment she gets. Well, it, it depends. It depends on the I mean, school. I mean, I know. I haven't been in elementary in a while. But so. That's, so that's where the coaching is important because as the okay. principals are sitting there with a grade two team and they're talking about, wow, we now have 10 students who have numeracy-based skills. That's where the math coach comes in and says, I'm going to support you in teaching numeracy more explicitly at tier one because we want to see less kids come up in this tiered meeting right now for needing intervention. So that's the hope is we're being preventative rather than reactive, encouraging more two, three numbers, keeping them more and stronger one. Right. And that's what we've been doing in language arts over the past couple of years. And we want to um, transition that to math. So that each school now has the same support that the charts so because we can see the results of, of that coaching model, right. coaching teachers on that tier one for all kids level. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, very can much. I just so I know Dennis has a question. Just one more, just a clarification. What do other what is like Old Line, Madison, Guilford? Like is this the preferred model that you see at, you know, I know some of those are in different dirks, but kind of the, some of the better schools that are nearby us. Is this like a common model to have the literacy coach, math coaches? Yes. yes. So instructional, instructional coaching is probably one of the most deemed as one of the more effective professional learning um, methodologies that you'll notice that people will, and, and the 70-30, and, and we actually have hosted a regional training uh, on instructional coaching, and no, all those towns came with their coaches and everything. We hosted it off-site, had 63 people show up from 12 different districts to say, come on in, let's look at Elena Aguilar's work on instructional coaching, let's get trained for two days together and create like a regional approach to it. So, Thank right. you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so much. Really helpful. I just wanted to add that you have to remember too that the tier one, two, and three, those interventions are at the elementary school level, but as those students progress into the middle school, there are not a lot of services at the middle school. And those kids get lost if we don't start actually putting more effort into the tier one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we need to get into the classroom. Just a, one, one question, this is more from, from a salesman perspective. Uh, um, so if we were to add, say, two, two math coaches, could we, could we have a slight reduction in the in, uh, number of paraprofessionals? Because you're going to adding two more bodies full time. So you must, so, so you really, so you, should, you should be able to say, it's not a one for one, yeah. but it sh you should be able to say this. Is, so what we're doing is we're saying, we're adding yeah. more capability and we're, and, and you know, in terms of, and that's more, and more expensive, mm -hmm. but, we're, but we are pulling back a little bit on this other, the other, this other service, which right. is trying to do some of it, some of it. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know if there's a way to, to set, set that up so that 
Yeah, or at least maybe hear the consensus on what the feedback would be by that. Because yeah. I mean, it's not. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, I just. You know, if you were to take away the pairs, which are incredibly needed, they're, they're mm -hmm. doing a tremendous amount of work, it might take away from the exact point of why we're putting people in place, right? Because we're putting them in place to be focused with math, but then you're going to take out two or three or how many other people. I'm just, That's what I'm, I'm saying. I was almost, I was kind of no, thinking more, it's like, it's like so add two math coordinators and you can reduce Mm -hmm. Arrows by one, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Yeah. That's just that's all. But yeah, so maybe the feedback on that from yep. some of the your yeah. curriculum professionals Okay. Good. Wow. So I, I have two more, but I'm gonna <laughs> no. I need pause and let others comment, and then I'll Lee, come back. Barry, uh, yeah. you think Amy here? You're good. Okay. okay. Well, we're ready for okay. another one. Okay. Okay. So. Um, Global language teacher. So um, when I sent in my feedback to Jeff, I had that as one of my top priorities. Because I feel like we committed to something um, coming into this year. You know, we took it away. We weren't a sort of, I, didn't, I didn't love the program. I think we were all, something wasn't working. We took it away. We said it was going to come back. So I felt like we committed for it to come back. Um, I don't know where I stand. I feel I don't know what others feel. I, I just I, my where I am is I definitely want to keep class sizes small. I, math is you know as a quantitative person, math is really important. I want to solve it. You guys help me understand. I think a little better because in my head I was like we don't need to spend all this. That there's a way to solve it in district without doing all that. If this is the right practice and the right thing to do, fantastic. And then we do that. Um, and I guess for me, just my comments is I think I defer global language for a year. I, I don't know what I don't know how we do all of this, um, and I don't want the board of finance to just start giving random numbers of cuts, um, which I, I worry. I agree with you, Tim. We can't do what we've done in the past. Hundred percent. That was my. I I thought that was the right way. It was the wrong way. Right. So. Um, but I also worry if we start creeping too high, yep. then they just say, ah, you're just throwing a number at us. You haven't done your homework. You haven't challenged enough. Then we're just going to come up and say, it's a, instead of 500, it's a million dollars we're going to cut, you know, or something crazy, right? They're just going to come with some numbers. So I do want to make sure that we've prioritized and that we've made a couple tough decisions. So for me, global language, I, unfortunately, even though I had it prioritized for myself, at right at this point, I think it's it's off. And then my other comment is on the IT manager. I guess it's a question for Amy because I had this. If we're going to invest a million dollars in technology, mm -hmm. are we investing a million dollars in technology and not going to prioritize the IT manager? And can we survive with that? Because I don't want to spend a million dollars on technology and then not have the right infrastructure from a people perspective. So we have the technology, the, the servers and the, the switches and whatever else we're going to invest in. Mm -hmm. um, I would hate to not have this. So can we survive? And survive is a bad word. Can we flourish? <laughs> I mean, can we actually utilize the question here is, this can technology? I survive? Can you, yeah, I, mean, I don't want you, I don't want you to be here. I don't uh -huh. want you to be our, you know, ticket person yeah. anymore, and yeah. that's that we need someone like this. So I, so I'd, I'd be interested in your thoughts. So I, I think for me, uh, one of the things that I've seen here as a trend in district is sometimes in the past when we've invested in something, we've invested in the thing, and we haven't necessarily invested in the management of the thing, so it's sustainable over time. Yeah. So that's part of what I feel is my to-do in the district, is to develop team-based models and capacity building when we roll things out. Yeah. I feel as though the instructional tech manager is a big piece of the pie for the teachers. Because I feel like I'm about ready to walk into Catherine Ellis' room saying, by the way, you now have a class set of laptops. You also have a grade level iPad. These are all the apps and everything. And she's going to look and she's going to go, oh my god, Angela. She's going to run to Angela. But her times 15 is going to be what goes to that instructional yeah. tech person. And I feel as though there has to be a very strategic management of those instructional techs. There's five of them. 
the way that we're do, sort of rolling out the help desk. We have the help desk staff, they report to the help desk or a manager now. They're analyzing the tickets on a biweekly basis. They're improving user experience. They're getting feedback and hitting proactively certain areas that we know that we need to address. I feel as though who's gonna suffer without this role would be the teachers and the implementation of the usage of the device. Because they can have these beautiful new devices but if they don't know how to do those things with the technology in order to build the student experience, we're, we're dead in the water. So and, for me, and that's- is this, a, Are we hiring uh, an employee or it's a out of our contract with- So when I look at most instructional tech managers, um, they're typically a certified teacher. Um, and the reason for that is because, um, teacher myself, you want to talk to a pra practitioner to practitioner. You want to you want to know. If we hire the techie person, they may not translate well into how it all works. Yeah, that's one of the reasons why when we hired the help desk supervisor, she was a teacher at one point and became a tech. Right. So, because what I quickly realized with the help desk is that if you don't have that educator hat on, you don't understand the urgency of that ticket. <laughs> so that was almost like my job of the yeah, last year. Yeah. Like, this is a big deal right now. That lab isn't occurring, which means that instruction has stopped. Yeah. <laughs> that is now urgent. Someone needs to get to that room right now. So that urgency is no, important. I, I agree 100%. The person we have is a teacher, was a yeah. teacher, yep. moved into this yep. role, is incredibly good at diffusing the stress level of <laughs> what's going on because they know... It, you need that person. Yeah. You need them to be a teacher, and 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 because they they're much, they have much more skill at at seeing what the teacher is trying to accomplish and helping them get there versus just getting the device to work yep. or or the software to run. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's really important to have someone with a teaching degree in that role, um, mm -hmm. who's also yeah. Yeah, yeah. has the techie hat as well. Someone who's yeah. So, I, I, so for me, that has to be much higher on our priority list because I don't want to spend a million right. dollars and not implement it right. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, when I hear from a theme perspective, again, this is mine, not yours, Jeff, you, you don't need to think, but what I'm hearing overall is we need to invest in technology, we need to make sure our class sizes are right, and we need to invest in coaches. And the coaches are both math coaches and this IT manager is kind of a coach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And those are kind of a few themes as we talk about this is the budget and this is what we're driving. But what does that mean that just fell out is what Jamie, so and maybe we do these others as well. I'm just trying to figure out, I don't know how high this budget's going to go. And if we're getting to five, five scares me a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I'd even rounding to five, I don't love. But, you know, if we can keep it at 4.49. Um, did you say 4.99 or did you say 4.99? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, and I don't know how, yeah, I don't know how real, maybe we, can't, maybe we can't get to 4.5. But, but I would, that's my uh, thinking, so I don't know what to do about the social worker and the board certified behavior analyst. And I don't know what to that's do important. with the global language. They're all important, but for me, me, the class size and the coaches seem like they're rising to the top. Can I, can I just inject one, one thing? Is yeah. Okay. So we've had two, day, uh, two meetings with public comment coming in focusing on um, saying we need to do something about our literacy um, programs at the elementary um, level. Yeah. And and um, I, I'm not, I, I don't want to put in, I don't want to, I, so we need to hear something from the administration on that in terms of what is, is there a, is there a problem? I mean, we were being told there's a problem. Is there a problem? What, what, what should we be doing to address that, that issue? I read, I read the article. I am now a genius on literacy. <laughs> um, I read the one article because in the opening, opening uh, paragraph, it mentioned Owasso, Michigan. Which is where you my were family <laughs> all <laughs> came from. <laughs> <laughs> so I was hooked. I read the whole thing. Okay, and it was. Um, and again, I'm sure that there's 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 all sorts of nuances, and we could have all sorts of debates about it. 
it was just a little bit eye-opening to me. Um, I drove my wife crazy, um, saying, "Did you read this?" And yeah. you know, and so um, I, I, I think we ought to, we should hear something about that, and mm -hmm. probably not to not today, but, right. but we, we really mm -hmm. need to hear something on this because I, as somebody said, I think Bonnie, well, one of the, one of the people, one of the speakers said it, which was, uh, "It is very uncommon to hear from parents from." Three, from three schools on the same same topic. Mm -hmm. Agreed. So, yep. so we should we should really be uh, be looking in. At that. I'd like our literacy consultants to be at the table when we discuss it. Yes. So now, yeah, do you I mean, want? And, and I, yeah, you, and mm -hmm. I think we should. Mm -hmm. Are you suggesting we do it here or at Triple A, or they have I, it and then come here? I I think that I think because I think it should come here. Yeah. I, 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 I think just because, just because of because the, it's, the, yeah. it's, yeah. and I think we we ought to hear. About it um, during a, during our budget deliberations here. I mean, if there's something if there's something that, that is needed, we ought to hear about it or what or or have some sense of what the plan is. I agree. Okay. okay. Totally agree. Good. Can I yeah. No. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. So, I'm coming at this with thir this is my 13th budget cycle, and it's always the same stuff on the chopping block. Um, and it's hurt our district, which we've seen with the state of our buildings, the state of our fleets, the state of our computers, mm -hmm. the state of our teachers, the state of our staff. We always cut before we go to the Board of Finance, before we go to the town. Um, and I think you're right. We need to give them it as it is and show them this is what we need. This is, we've been dying. We've been floundering. Slowly for years because we're scared of you, we're scared of what you're going to do to us. Um, so we cut things that we really need in order to survive. Um, <coughs> excuse me. With that being said, this is the second time we've cut global language in my time that I've been here. Mm -hmm. um, the first time we cut it because it was an unsuccessful program and we promised <coughs> parents, we promised teachers, we promised students when we brought it back, it would be successful. And we had to fight to get it back. And we brought remember? it back. Mm -hmm. We had to fight to get it back. Yes, we did. <laughs> and it was kind of like a half a program hybrid that really didn't do anything. It didn't teach our students any language. Um, it cut learning time. It cut class time. It shuffled our kids around. And I think, mm -hmm. honestly, they became more confused. Mm -hmm. And we had a teacher running from three and schools. And we had a teacher yes. running from three schools. So again, we brought back an unsuccessful global language program. And it's back on our budget this year to come back into our schools. And while I agree, we need a global language program and we need a global language starting at kindergarten, I don't want to see us do it again. I don't want to see us put in another global language program that's not successful. That's not teaching our children anything. That's confusing them. That's hurting teacher time. That's hurting our kids. I mean, I have an 11th grader currently who knows no Spanish, and he's been taking Spanish since third grade. I have an 8th grader who's been taking Spanish since fifth grade, and she knows no Spanish. It, it's just we're having these kids take a language that they're really not learning. And before we put it back, I'd like to see us make sure we're doing it the right way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, true talk to them. And I mean, my kindergartner knows more Spanish than my seventh grader, my eighth grader, and my twelfth grader. And I don't know why, but she does, and she's never had Spanish. So I just, <laughs> I just, I don't want to have us put it back and then cut it again next year because it's not a successful program again. Um, I do need, think we need it, but I don't want to just say, well, we took it, we promised the parents we'd put it back next year, and we put it back. And it really yeah. not do what yeah. we want it to do. Because it, then it would be a waste of everyone's time and everyone's money, and nobody needs that. We can give them quality time mm -hmm. and not waste their time. Yep. Good. Very good. Thanks, Okay. So every year I often ask myself, what would I do if I was on the Board of Finance? <laughs> what would I do? And I've talked a lot about revenue, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. And how, what the potential is that we have to create a revenue. And that is something 
And I think that if I didn't bring it up, I think that somebody would say, well, why haven't they talked about it, to be honest with you? Because I know that I would. If I was on the Board of Finance, I would ask us, this, this board, what are you doing? How are you trying to bring funds in, right? And the spiral program has, um, in the past few years when it had started, was something that helped fund our global language program. Mm -hmm. And we are in discussions with Spiral now, whether or not it's going to continue or not with Spiral or possibly another third party, I don't know. Um, but that was a revenue that was coming in. Mm -hmm. So I encourage that kind of discussion. I know that I'm on board for that type of discussion. Um, and you'll have to excuse my voice. I'm sorry. I'm trying. Um, the other revenue that I'm um, going to hone in on is the wing at Lily B where I want to say it was 68000 Yes, we yeah, that's right. Okay, on 60. a yearly basis. It's a lot of money, and it could help fund some of the things that we're talking about. Um, we've talked about a possible pre-K program, tuition-based. You know, there's um, a few things that we can uh, think about and possibly leasing it out, I don't know, but to bring in some revenue that could help, help offset some of the cost. Um, and I think it's important to have that conversation. Good. So. Good. 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 Oh, I'm sorry. Lee. I think she was first. In that same vein, I know the past two budget cycles, Board of Finance has asked us about um, incentivizing folks waiving health insurance. Have yes. we done any more like legwork on that? I'm just envisioning several months from now they're going to ask if we pursued that or looked at it deeper. We, we talked about that. We, I, did, um, I did a survey among, um, I put out a survey on my listserv, CASBO, and many municipal, many t districts have gone away from it. There's very few. I have, a, I have the, the outcome right. of the survey. Yes. So very few um, districts offer it because it really wasn't, um, didn't, didn't seem to incentivize people away from it, so they got away from it. And in order for us to figure out if it would be worth it, we'd have to know who would not take the insurance. So it's not a, you know, it's, it's not as easy as, as saying we'll offer $1,000 to not take the insurance and you know whether or not it would be a savings. Because we'd have to, the people that, there's an added cost because we'd have to start to start it up. Everybody. Well, so currently, currently whoever isn't, isn't taking it, obviously, we, we, get the, we yeah. would have to. I just think we have to be yeah. prepared to feel that question. Yeah. Again, no, it's a, point. Bring it's I have a good point. You're right, Lee. They did bring it up last I have year. it. I actually have a spreadsheet on that. So I think sharing that directly with them would be helpful because yeah. I know that that's been a big point yeah. of contention yeah. every year. One thing we haven't talked about is, you know, this year with the state plan that we're on now, I mean, our claims have been not that. You know, the state plan is driving claims, but our claims have been much lower. We just heard yeah. that from um, the first selectman and, yeah. and the yes. town uh, finance director. So that that's a good thing. Our numbers are coming in, uh, you know, much lower. So that helps. I think as we move forward, it's stabilizing that that number because it was like 28 percent of an increase last year or for this current year, and now we're at nine percent. We're putting a nine percent for next year. Nine. So much different. Yeah, Jamie. Um, on the vein of what the board of finance is going to ask. Um, they always also ask us about pay to play. Oh. And for those of you oh. who did not make our meeting last for AAA last meeting, which is in the meeting minutes, yeah, which is or in the mine. minutes, but yep. so they we gave Steve mm -hmm. Harness came to our meeting and gave us a printout of what each sport, mm -hmm. yes, parents pay. I have it. In my parents, not board. Parents, parents pay, parents. not school pays. It's what parents pay. Um, and I think the lowest sport on here is maybe $130 the parents pay a season. Um, but they average out parents pay. Oh, up to $1,000. Up to, some of them $2,000 yeah. a sport. Or more. Um, yeah. But a couple hundred dollars. Cup, but there, yeah. it's, it's at least $300 an average right. sport. Yeah. But just to clarify, it's not to the school. It's for the it's, equipment it's that's equipment, needed. Supplies, so your bats, uniforms. your sure. sneakers. Anything your, that's your, not yeah, anything that's not. Right. Yeah. So what my, my, my suggestion is, is we take it 
we take how many kids are in each sport, we multiply it out. Football, parents pay, there's 66 kids, this is what parents are paying, this is how much it cost us. Uh, my second suggestion is, as I know I asked you, for the same sheet yeah. yep, for, um, for the band, band mm -hmm. yep. drama, oh, and all yeah, the arts could, yeah. to add that, because they put out a lot too. Um, and yeah. they fundraise and they do all that stuff. So if you look at that burden of $2,000 a sport and then you're going to add in a pay to play when they're already paying to play. Pretty much. I mean, yeah. some of these yeah. parents are paying for field usage, they're paying dues, meat fees right. on top of yeah. their mm -hmm. taxes right. and everything else their student needs to come to school every day. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. And the impression out there is that. Right, that the school pays exactly. for everything, the taxpayers pay for all of your sports, and yeah, they do, but you also pay a pretty penny yourself um, on top of your taxes, um, which I don't think that they see that. <coughs> so I, I would really think that they need this document with that addition of this is how many kids, this is how many parents are kids participate, so they can see it's not like a 10 student score or 15 student score. Of students in them, um, and I know we cut last year. We cut middle school sports because we were looking for things to cut. And that took a lot of hit on a lot of kids and a lot of families. Um, but I think that's something that we're going to have to talk about because it is something that they're always pushing at us to do pay to play. But as this piece of paper shows, we are already paying to play. For those who thought we weren't, we really yeah. are. Yeah. Yep. Good. Very good. Excellent. Excellent. Jill. Can we make that document? I went home and looked at it again after the meeting, and it really humanized or made real the fact. I know what I paid, and I just think if you're going to put it in just a total of it's you know 300 per person to play sport. I like the way it said the individual. Well, no, I'm sport. saying keep it like this. <coughs> oh, okay. Add in how Hold many up. students per game. Okay. Or I just think that document is very very good, and I think the board of finance needs to see it the way it is. Because it, it is home. They may have two kids in a sport. It's nice to see everyone's paying. Hey. I just need to add on, on the um, yeah. revenue that Coastal Connections, of course, too, because we have yeah. tuition. Yeah. Yep. But we had talked yep. about possibly branding, just having a conversation revolving around that, that type mm -hmm. of thing, yep. because um, that could also bring more money. Yep. Into the only with tuition students, if the money goes right to the town, it doesn't. Well, that's well, the spiral. Even though so, still, even coastal still connections, it, we can use it to our still, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's yep. not something that we, we can, use can it really as generate, but exactly. it is something yeah. that they do like. They like to sell. It's not targeted for our budget. Anyone who pays tuition is not targeted back mm -hmm. to our budget. Yeah, it goes, it goes straight to the town. To the so town. all the money that goes to park and recs is that targeted back to their budget, or it goes into the general fund? We use some money to park and. Park Let's say back. you're paying fees for park and rec. Well, that like, goes to park and rec because it's a self-sustaining program. Right. Yeah, field, field uh, use. Yeah, they can make a profit. Yes, they can, but it's usually not. <laughs> no, yeah, I know. Yeah. Eric, just um, kind of switching gears from the investments and just saying, well, what are some areas of potential savings? I guess um, I'd ask the elementary school uh, principal as well as kind of middle school, high school. Is um, Mariana included a nice? Uh, schedule that shows kind of compares the three schools and the two schools to say how much you spend in each area. And as I went through there, and I'm not going to go, Mariana got some of my questions, but um, some of them are small. But you look, and some it's just there's different, num you know, where one one school might have more than the others. Mm -hmm. So if you guys can just talk and see, you know, whoever's lowest, why are they lowest, and is there anything we can do differently to go towards that? We're not going to save a million dollars looking at that, but I don't know if there's 20,000, 30,000, 50,000 or something like that in same middle school and high school, which is a little different, um, but we don't have any other benchmark. But it's just something at least you can benchmark and look across. So I guess I'd ask is just take a look at those and see if there's anything that we can do differently. Um, the other one I asked about, and I, I don't want to spend too much time, but we, we do have software increasing as well. Yeah. And some of the software are multi-year licenses, and we pay for them all up front. And I would be interested in talking to the town. I don't know if we need to have a broad discussion, because it would seem similar to um, hardware infrastructure 
technology from software perspective, if we're buying a license and just say it's 100000 but it's a three-year license, mm -hmm. that we should pay the 33000 per year and not 100000 one year and then zero, zero. Uh, not pay, but the expense, sorry, the budget impact would be spread out. And I'd be happy to talk to someone as well, but it just doesn't make sense. And maybe we could get someone from the Board of Finance. Like Camille seemed on board <laughs> with some of that thinking as well. So I can, I can briefly explain yeah. if, if you want. So yeah. the, it's, it's a license, so it's not anything we're going to borrow for. So it's $98,000 if we pay for the three years up front. They want their 98000 Yeah. So there's no mechanism. It's not like in a business where you don't you, you, you right you capitalize yeah. right and you have a yeah. pre you know it yeah. sits on yeah. your balance sheet yeah. Yeah. and you only expense it as each year so you're still paying in yeah. the business sector yeah. you're still going to pay the ninety eight thousand yeah. hits your cash but it's not yeah. impacting right. your expense it's different here we're not on a full accrual basis of accounting so it's every okay. year so that ninety eight thousand unless you borrow for it, which would not, you know, I wouldn't no. recommend you borrow for a license, obviously. So that's the only way So there's really, it. right, there's no way because the company wants their money mm -hmm. now. Yeah, I understand, the cash right. goes out the door, but right. from a budget So that's what, right, so the cash still has to get paid and we don't, there's no. Uh, okay. Mechanism to okay. do that, if that makes okay. any sense. Okay, thank you, yep. So I, before we move on to the technology, I just have one other, one other comment. I think some, somebody said this. Um, I'll just I'll say it again. And that is what we've heard from the board is we want, we, we, we want if not all of it, almost all of it. And we, and, we want to, and we want to spend money to protect class size as well. So I would look for the administration to put together that. That's what we're, ask, we're asking for. And then I also would like you to, for the administrative team, to sit back and say, if we were so fortunate that we could get it all, including the technology, do we actually have the administrative capacity to implement all? Mm -hmm. So, you know, rolling out not only math coordinators, the technology stuff, and global language all at the same time, with a, do you actually have the capacity? And so, we really need to be able to, 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 to say that. So, so if we're going to ask, if we're going to ask for a fairly substantial number, we need to know for sure that if we get, get it, that we, in fact, will be able to deliver on it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, mm -hmm. so we're going to need, need that. Okay. Okay. So do you want to, we, you want, everybody want to flip gears and shift over to technology at this point? <coughs> okay. So, Jeff, do you have any opening? Um, just to, to recap, uh, it sits at uh, two pieces, our um, <coughs> infrastructure. So one of the slides we showed in the PowerPoint uh, last uh, Monday night was finish off the high school uh, for, we've already started the infrastructure here. Let's talk infrastructure first. We've already started it here, uh, <coughs> finish that off, um, redo the middle school uh, because that hasn't been done in multiple, multiple years. So we get the middle school done and then central office as well. We have coastal there now. Um, that was about 34,000 for central office. So and the elementaries are done. The building projects took care of all of the um, infrastructure and wireless access points, et cetera. So that added up to roughly what's the number of, uh, about four to five hundred thousand dollars just for the infrastructure. That was half of the 927. Oh, yes. 421. Yes. The high yeah, school, middle school, and central office. 421. 421, 326. 421, okay. So that was that side. Then the mobile learning devices was the other half of that. Um, and, uh, you know, Amy had rolled out some of her slides, you know, the plan. It really kind of was like a three-year phase in plan, um, starting with specific grade levels, which we're happy we can recap uh, that is necessary. But dollar amount equated to about 500000 total about 927000 roughly, um, that we would want to go through the town for. And I know we've had a lot of, you know, robust discussion outside. Uh, you know, Barry sent some some statistics and information, and I know, Barry, you brought some things you wanted to kind of share on that, you know, this evening as well, so I know he wants to share on, on that piece, but, so that's where we're at, basically, uh, with technology and our needs, and we can talk about, you know, specifically, uh, Amy's got the, the data on what devices you know, we're looking at as well, if necessary. 
kind of open it up for Barry, you want to? You want to? Yeah, you want to. Hi, Barry, yeah. So Barry's been doing a lot of homework here. Are you able to present it tonight? I'm talking to you. I don't know me. I'm new to the board. I was so successful for like 30 years. Most of the research on how people learn. Barry, you, you address the board. No, you, 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 you're talking to us. <laughs> they, they can listen. Great. All right. Um, is that okay if I stand up? If, well, I, normally we sit, okay. but, uh, I will but, sit down, but we'll, we'll, what, we, what we do want to hear what they have to say. Okay. For sure. So he gets into the thing. So um, related to uh, technology, I was kind of at the dawn of it started to get into this. Uh, I remember one of my first graduate courses I was teaching uh, was just when Wang came out with a thing called the word processor. And I still can hear the howls of protest uh, from the students I had. We gave them an assignment that said, you have to produce a one-page letter to me using a word processor. And believe me, someplace in your district, in your town, whatever, there's a thing called the word <coughs> processor because very soon computers are going to, I mean, Typewriters are going to be obsolete, and everything you're going to be doing is being done on the word processor. And uh, it was like pulling teeth to get people to do that back at that time. So I always tried to uh, be intrigued with the power of uh, information technology to uh, change the face of education. And I've been intrigued over the years how many, many districts continually talk about how their um, Progress, their achievement levels are plateauing, and they maintain the same plateau for year after year, and they still maintain the same approaches to how they're going about their instructional process. And it's always intrigued me that there must be some ways that we could uh, maybe uh, refine or uh, adapt our the processes we use in schools, and I think that computers are a resource that could be very, very useful. And I think that uh, from you know the years, their potential has not been realized. Um, research shows that just putting computers in a school, uh, the devices themselves, isn't really going to do any good. There is a very careful way that they have to be used in school. Let me summarize some of the uh, research here that shows that they're, when they're used in a certain way, they can have answers on learning. I use a statistic called the D, um, Cohen's D, which basically, if you read that, if you look in education, kind of the average of an educational intervention is about four tenths of a standard deviation improvement. So if you look at numbers with D that are higher four, than four, then you know that it's something that's better than the average. Um, there is, if you look at the future, there's a really critical need for education, for um, advancing the use of technology, of information technologies in schools. One of the, um, of the many um, reports I've read on this came from the um, World Economic Forum on the future of jobs. And basically they've said, you know, like, Jobs are going to, computers and technology is going to replace jobs, but there's also going to be a related increase of jobs. So we're going to lose some jobs, we're going to increase jobs, and the people that are going to benefit from those are the individuals who have what are called future-proof skills, which is the ability to adapt and learn and change their process as technology changes around them. I work with one uh, corp large corporation here in Connecticut where the CFO had a legion of MBAs who were doing accounting for him. And he said, uh, I hired them four, five, six years ago, and many of them are obsolete now because they've not kept up with the changes in the software programs. Mm -hmm. And he said, so what I'm going to have to do is um, I have to riff them. I have to get rid of them because they've been, they don't seem to have the capacity to learn the changes that are coming up in the software programs because we're integrating our accounting with purchasing, with sales, and he said, they have, I don't need people who can produce 
profit loss statements. I need people who can give me projections, who can give me trends, who can tell me where we're going in this. And he said to do that, they have to enhance their learning skills. So um, we also have a tendency to think that the current crop of students we have are uh, very um, advanced in computer use because they're hanging around uh, Fortnite, uh, uh, Facebook, uh, TikTok, Twitter. Um, but there was a very interesting study that came out of Stanford where they looked at students' ability to analyze information that came from the internet. And the researchers say that generally when they have this large of a population, what they'll find is a general spread of capabilities. They were absolutely amazed that across all age groups, middle, high school, college, that that whole variance collapsed into a very narrow range that was very bleak. In other words, these students did not seem to have the capability of processing and interpreting information that they ran to on the internet. So the whole background I had um, when I am looking for, when I moved to East Lyme, I started working with, uh, in the middle school, on the idea of are there ways that we can um, use computers and information technologies to advance students' learning in this notion of advancing their ability to future-proof their skills so that we basically enhance their ability as learners as we're teaching the content. Uh, first was kind of frustrated at the uh, lack of uh, computers uh, and the difficulty of getting into computers and the whole infrastructure problem and all the stuff we've talked about up here. Mm -hmm. So um, we bought computers. I just I bought computers for a, for a classroom to see what would happen if we gave everybody in that classroom a computer. And then we, um, I, so I started to work on this idea, can we develop an instructional program that enhances students' ability to future-proof their skills? I drew on several conceptual frames, uh, one from the issue of uh, self-regulation where individuals regulate to a task as they understand it. So I asked, said, can we ask students, how do they understand the task of learning? We understand how they understand the task of learning, we'll understand how they regulate it. We also knew that uh, the greatest influence on change is the environment in which um, an action occurs. So the second question is, well, what would happen if we change the nature of the classroom in which students are learning? <coughs> would that lead to a change in their learning process? And the third we knew is that information technologies had a broad access to multiple, multiple, multiple resources for um, instructional purpose to enhance learning. And so what would happen if we drew upon those resources? So what we did, again, we purchased computers for one class. Um, we set up a comparison of this one class of mariners versus uh, that we're going to use the information technologies with another class didn't. And where I'm going this, I'm trying to like outlay a picture of what is possible with using information technologies in a way to enhance students ability to future-proof their skills. So we set up a comparison. We um, gathered information on students' perspectives on learning, and basically we surveyed them and said, give me an example of a time when you were a good learner. What did you do? We worked with the librarians to set up a web-based um, program within the using the, the, the school's uh, library internet. And we accessed uh, sources such as e-books, um, e-articles, uh, videos, short movies, uh, databases such as the New York Times, National Geographic, and we put them all up using a filter that Pat helped us get, which is like what safe, uh, safe, link. safe, safe proof. So everything that came in was basically safe, and the kids couldn't go accessing all around. So again, thank you for your work on that. Pat. Um, we use the capability on um, Infinite Campus for asynchronous uh, threaded discussions for students to actually talk with each other, you know, on the, uh, using the internet and basically replace what would be a small round the table discussion with ongoing discussions on the uh, internet. And we changed the format of the class 
such that um, when you walked into this class, you would see students with laptops who would be accessing information on the, um, the web-based uh, library resource. They'd be talking with other students on the uh, asynchronous discussion, and they would be addressing a question of, um, I use an example here from the American Revolution where there was like, what were the interrelationship among the factors that eventually led to the success of the American Revolution? This is in contrast to the way the class had been taught before where students memorized or learned stuff like what were the intolerable acts? You know, what, uh, what happened at the Battle of Saratoga? Uh, we also used, uh, in other ways, um, the internet, we were studying Tanzania. We set up a Skype link with a, a school that I had worked with down in Tanzania so that the students actually talked to each other. And they learned about Tanzania by one-on-one -on -one conversations with another group of similar students at a middle school in Tanzania. So the teach so when students would open their, um, they came to class, opened their laptops, started working on the item that they chose to work on that day. Teacher would be walking around, helping, you know, questioning them, what were they doing? They were talking with other students on this internet uh, discussion, uh, web-based. And the teacher kept prompting them all along the way to change their perspective from the term we use as being a good student to being a good learner. And uh, when students came up with questions, they would say, is this the right thing to do? And the teacher would respond to say, well, what would a good learner ask? You know, so basically to get them to thinking about their own learning processes. So the results of this, in October, I analyzed all the results um, using a scale and found out that on this question of good learner, uh, about 20% of the students demonstrated what could uh, be called low agency. I was a good learner when I paid attention and listened to the teacher. Uh, about another, about 23% said, I was a good learner when I worked hard and I did my assignment. About 35% said, I was a good learner on this time when I took notes, studied, um, did my assignments, and got a good grade on the test. So that brings us up to about 75% of the learners are sitting in the classrooms, and as one student said when I asked them, tell me, you know, did you have, what was the best class you had today? And after some continued prompting, they said, well, it was science. And I said, well, what did you do in science? And they said, well, we had a uh, project to uh, make a PowerPoint on something, nat uh, something synthetic that's replacing something natural, so I did it on AstroTurf. And I completed that. I finished my PowerPoint two days ago, and because everybody else is still working on it, I can work on the computer and play games. You know, as opposed to, I'm thinking, you know, a good learner would say, well, I'm going to keep working on this, I'm going to learn more, but, you know, the idea is that I'm a student, I was given an assignment, I'm only supposed to do this, I did it, I'm done. Only 15% um, of students kind of took some initiative to advance their learning, they organized their notes, they asked for help, and about 7% actually started thinking about, this is what I know, this is what I want to know, and here's a plan of how I can get there which are the kind of students that we would hope uh, we're producing. Those are the students of the future-proof uh, um, future skills. So then we put both classes through the same thing, one through a traditional approach, um, the other one went through this more information-rich approach using uh, laptops every day to explore stuff, asynchronous discussions, uh, developing and understanding what are the links and connections between all these factors. In June, um, so at the start, there was no difference between the two classes in terms of how they approach learning. Basically, the approach was, well, I pay attention, I studied, I get a good mark on the test, kind of across the board. In June, in contrast to the traditional class, which we saw no gain in, we had about a one standard deviation gain among the students in the information-rich class in terms of the shift from listen, pay attention, get a good mark, to I can um, basically think, plan, gain information, and uh, put it together in a systemic way to uh, answer a question. And you'll see a, uh, on a, the, a chart there that demonstrates the kind of thinking that these students came up with. So at the center, there's a point of 
So what were the factors that led to the, the uh, success of the American Revolution? And although the print is small there, you'll see a very intricate, re interactive, uh, iterative, and reciprocal set of uh, systemic relationships of how this fifth grade student put together a picture of what happened in the American Revolution as compared to students from the comparative class who are taking quizzes on, you know, what were the definition of the intolerable acts? Not that there's anything wrong with that, but if we're going to future-proof, uh, develop these skills, ability to future-proof their skills, this is the type of thinking that they're going to need when they go into corporations. So um, I could talk on this for four hours without notice, <laughs> uh, but basically just to kind of come down to the thing. So, my point is that as we think about technology, I'm suggesting that we have to think that there is a way, a potential for using technology that is very, very different from many of the processes that are current happening in our classrooms. And we can have them work in a way that's going to help students develop an ability to future-proof their skills. And uh, basically, that the implications I've seen here is that if students day-to-day -day care uh, students day-to-day -day and carefully designed use of information technologies can provide weighted experiences that help them develop the ability to future proof their skills. The use of online discussion forums can advance, advance students' ability to future proof their skills through engagement with the topic, peer-to-peer, -peer, student to student, student to teacher, discussions, the quality of discussions, and the depth of their inquiry. In classroom settings with enriched information technologies supported by a technological infrastructure, can readily enhance students' ability to future-proof their skills. And I can go on and on about that, but that's just one up again. As we think about technology and think about the fact that there's been a lot of plateauing of um, the outcomes of our learning for years, if we could think of very different ways of using technology as a way to advance students' ability to be learners and the ability to students to think systemically, um, we can help them future proof the skills they're going to need to live in a new age. So that's wow. as, as it's very good as I could do it. Yeah, no, it's very, it's very good. So, so I, I would, would you, you would, it, would you conclude that that it's a wise thing to invest in our infrastructure? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Good. Harry is all for it. If we want our students to still be, I'm a good learner when I yep. sit, pay yep. attention, take notes, and get a grade on the test. <clears throat> we can keep doing what we are, what we're doing. If we want them to be able to basically think systemically and have increased agency as, learning, as learners, we have to really change the processes with the assistance of information technologies. Yep. Yep. And I think that's the choice we have. And that's why I'm all in for going to increase the technologies to get the infrastructure then and then get into a massive uh, in, in discussions on how we can use it. Use it, yeah, yeah. But the, yeah no, this I, is only I, one way. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Maybe a thousand sure. different ways that yeah. I've seen yeah. teachers use this. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. It, you're absolutely right. I've just your opening remarks. I I was the uh, first person at the University of Michigan in the College of Pharmacy to write his dissertation on a word processor. Was it but a K Pro? I, I, was I it a K Pro? What? Was it a K-Pro? No, no, it was, it was a university word processing system. Oh, no, no. And it was on, on a mainframe, and it was, a, it was amazing. But, when uh, I did my dissertation, we thought that the advance in technology was the Xerox machine. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that's good. Any questions for, for Barry on what he just, just shared, shared with us? It's very, very interesting. And uh, Thank you, I, Barry. I certainly, uh, uh, it's great, but it, it does illustrate how rapidly things are moving and changing, and and we have to we we have to catch. There's a huge amount of catching up that we have to do. We're so fortunate that we've been able to make the investment in our elementary schools and include mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with the upgrading of all of the uh, technology there. Um, and it's just a matter of making sure we, we get our uh, middle school and high school up to the same same level of uh, functioning, um, so we can uh, have 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 the complete continuum there. It's because it's pretty amazing what what it's going to be like for the kids that are in kindergarten and first grade right now when they uh, when they're when they're out in the workplace. 
I just much, much and, and you know, Barry's right. The jobs, you know, oh. the, some will still be here, but new ones are going to form. The yeah. we right. have no right. idea what they're going to be. Yeah. Um, so there was just I was talking to my uh, primary care physician the other day, and he was uh, lamenting about he is now burdened with this thing called the health portal. Oh, yeah. 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 And yeah. he is struggling with how is, I, he said, my medical education, nobody ever told me I was going to have to be doing the health portal where patients are sending me messages and questions and whatever. How do I manage that? Oh, I have blessing. to learn how to develop that. Wow. You know, and it, it's a skill that medical educators, when I, when I was in school, never thought of. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And that's a whole access yeah. addition to his job. That is new, and he can only, he's doing it because he has what's called future-proof skills. He knows how to learn, adapt, yeah. and change a skill set to address it. That's, 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 that's so I, just, I just have a question, but let me, I was just thinking about what you said. So I think if you're fluent in those type of skills, I'm saying this wrong, if you're comfortable with, uh, oh shoot, just went out of my head. I'm going to have to wait and ask you again. But basically, if you're able, uh, able to move around the different type of technology, different programs or whatever, I would assume then your future proof, your, um, your, your skills are intact and you can go anywhere and do everything as long as you can move anywhere in the technology world. So, you know, whether it's a program or a new device or because once you've established that pathway of learn of of understanding basically what technology is and how you ad how you address it, then aren't you aren't you pretty much able to it's do not that? technology per se? It's technology as a tool a that one. is going to enable students to develop these future proof, proof skills. So we so you're saying future proof skills is a way of thinking. Is a way of thinking. Got it. Okay. And what we were able to do in a classroom. Uh, with just like a teacher at the center of it. It's very difficult for the teacher to set up multiple options for students. Yep. What we're able to do in this classroom is that, you know, if a student came in using the, the web board, using the discussions, you know, mm -hmm. they could come in and, oh, today, well, what happened <coughs> in the American Revolution thing? One of the student, a uh, small group, uh, group of girls came up and said, we're looking through all this stuff. There are no women here. We knew there were women around on the revolution. There's nothing in our books, nothing on your web board about women. We want to go and find out about women and their role in the revolution. And we were able to work with them, and we found a place where a library had digitalized um, diaries of women during the revolutionary oh, period. Awesome. And they were able to go in and look at that. All right, so it's not that they were used, they learned, they, were, they weren't learning technology, they were learning to use technology to think systemically and access resources that could help them address problems and questions. So it's, it's how to use technology to think systemically and to enhance their own agency as learners. Good. Good. Jane? Okay. So the cost. That you have is that. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you. <laughs> Sorry, Amy. Yes. <laughs> that 421 to 326, is that just for infrastructure? Yep. That doesn't include the assets that you have on Correct. 13? Correct. The 421 is for middle school, finishing the high school, and central office. Okay. Do we have a total for assets? Yeah, that's what I was. That should be five. So five oh five. Five oh five. Two twenty. Yeah. And we are hoping to put both of them on the capital improvement plan. Combined. Yep. Combined. Yes. Combined. One line item. Yep. Yes. 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 So then, from there, one. Is this the only quote we have, or do we have multiple quotes? And is it something that needs to go out to bid? because it's going on capital improvement. Yeah, yes. Are you talking, which ones? Are, yeah. But, I, both. I mean, do okay. they, do we, is this the only price we've ever gotten? Or is this an so average I'll of the prices we've gotten? So or? I'll speak to the devices in the sense that we have multiple quotes on okay. devices. And actually, one of the things we're going to be asking teachers and students to do is vote. <laughs> is 
eventually on samples um, and bring them into their spaces and say, okay, teachers, here are two or three different versions of a laptop that you would use. Which one do you find is more, and allow them to give sort of the feedback. So, so we, this is kind of like an average of all of our quotes. So what we ended up doing was we used an average in order to determine the pricing structure the for, yes. Okay. yes. So we, we will, theoretically, it will get approved at capital improvement at the town meeting and we can go out to bid on this from several sources. We, yes, we would have to go out to bid, correct. So Once we determine what we need, um, when Amy determines that, we'll write up specifications and we would have to go out to bed. Which item is for us, it's something that we've never done. So. Well, no, we no, 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 we, we no, did. No, I mean like we've never. We haven't gone this high before. Right, right. that's what I'm saying. We've never done this. We've never done this We've never done this before. <laughs> <laughs> we've been, we've been, <laughs> we did 500,000. No, I know, years. but this is, we're talking. No, you're you're basically, devices, yeah, you're, you're doubling. Yep. This is a big big purchase for us. Yep. Maybe if you think about it, put it in perspective, I don't know why yeah, I'm missing something. The Board of Finance would necessarily say no to this because Listen, I don't know why we're borrowing, they say no the, we're, yeah, things, we're borrowing so. the money, <laughs> we're paying it back. Well, you know, well, they, they, I don't they, know their it's the bonding. some days. So. Yeah, I think it's, it's our debt. It's, it's yeah, debt I, and it's bonding. It's my debt. Exactly. So that, that could be the only. I have to definitely. ask the question. Mm -hmm. That's how um, and then, so We've been talking one-to-one -one devices for a long time mm -hmm. um, and how we've been looking at other school districts and how they're doing it um, and coming up with policy and regulation and all this other stuff to govern it, maintenance, mm -hmm. budgets, yeah. what happens if one breaks, who's paying for it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We don't have that in place. Mm -hmm. um. <laughs> it's that additional technology. <laughs> have a policy in place. Mm -hmm. We don't have a regulation in place. Um, That's if we go outside, if we send them home devices, yeah. home right, with kids. Right, but still, so not, what if they break it in the classroom? It. Well, it's the, they're there now. That's, yeah, yeah. that's what we do. Right, I, I know we that. We have so a repair what, fix. What I'm saying is, is we need to have more discussion on what we're going to do with them before we buy them. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Because we haven't had this discussion. We theoretic theoretically we've talked about how wonderful it would be and how great it would be, but we haven't mm -hmm. talked about what are we going to do with them? Mm -hmm. yeah. What's going to happen? Right. Um, so I think that that's definitely a conversation we're going to need to have um, mm -hmm. before we say, hey, let's get all of our fifth graders a one-to-one -one device. What are we planning on doing with them? Mm -hmm. Which we can definitely have, Jamie. I think that's a good um, idea. Mm -hmm. What are they going to do? The, break, the breakdown, yeah. I mean, what are the I, I, I see the whole approach to everything, but what are we going to do with? What's it going to look like? Here? Right, 90 Got computers it. in the hands mm -hmm. of fifth graders. Like, what does that look like? Mm -hmm. um, and if we do send them home, what does that look like? We would not be looking no, at this. saying if we did, what does it look like? <laughs> okay. Because we ha it has been a conversation. Mm -hmm. Because. I know that my kids come home and they say, hey, I have to print this. I don't have a printer. I don't know what you want me to do. Mm -hmm. Put it on a zip, print it at school. Okay. So what are we asking? Because I know, and you all know, that we can't mandate that right. they have a computer. Right. Yeah. Yep. We can't mandate that they have a printer. We can't mandate that they have a tablet. We can't mandate that they have a phone to do their <coughs> classwork on. Mm -hmm. So what are we doing to make sure that we're all having that equal education? Great question. Mm -hmm. yep. Is that specifically for the deployment of one to one at grade five? Well, that I mean, that's my main question because okay. I mean, the, the other grades there. I just want to make like sure a, I get you the right information. The other grades are getting kind of like a shared yeah, right. correct. device. Yes. But that one, okay. one to one thing is my big concern. No problem. No problem. Good. Other comments on technology? Eric? Joe? Lee? Anything? I won't ask Barry as well. Spend it. I, I really just good. want to reemphasize the um, position for technology. What's our title for that person? Oh, the instructional tech manager. Instru yeah. It, mm -hmm. The future proofing the kids is one thing. We got to future proof our teachers as well yeah, and true, um, true. make sure that they're. Because um, they're going to be some that embrace it 
wholeheartedly and are, are willing or have the time or resources or background that's going to make it easy and there are other folks who are not going to be able to utilize it to yeah. the fullest um, without some assistance mm -hmm. and we've got to make sure that we provide that. Yeah, it's a big learning curve too for them. For some. It's huge. For sure. I mean it's part of why you're also seeing within my budget district wide you're seeing some of the PD dollars increase. These are big thought initiatives. This is you know, part of why we call this a mobile learning environment is because this is environmental change within our classrooms. You know, the schema of your part of when you work with like the Universal Design for Learning um, CAST, they're called, the organization to really begin to look at, the first thing they do is the schema of the classroom and how it changes when you break down barriers for students. And part of that is tech as a tool and what does that look like? And so this is, this is big. This is, this is a big initiative for us and embracing that level and it should have a classroom environment implication as well as a student outcome implication for us. Um, but we also feel as though there's such urgency around it and I don't want to speak on behalf of the teacher. I can't imagine if we don't do it. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just, yeah. even, even, you know, just hearing the parents as they've come to a public comment and talk about it. I mean, tech, and to Barry's point, tech is a tool. There's some of the accommodations and modifications some of these parents' children are getting. They would have as part of just good quality tier one instruction because they have a tool available to them right. to do voiceover text and to be able to speak into an iPad to write the paragraph rather than have to deal with some of the mm -hmm. executive functioning of writing. Why? Because we just supply that in K-1-2 classrooms because that's just good for kids. So those are some of the things that, you know, and they don't need a plan for that. We just want kids to have choice in their environment and be able to have exposure to it. So, better learners. yeah, I think for us, it's more of a um, without having it. And again, I don't want to speak, but I feel comfortable speaking in the sense that it's a barrier. By not having these things, we actually are creating barriers for our students' level of success, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it, I, yeah. I just want to thank all of you for, you know, the last couple of years we've, we've kind of come to the table and it's been how do we reduce, how do we reduce. But, you know, tonight I, I just I really appreciate the support you're hearing and listening to everything that we've talked about. And, you know, there's a lot of hard work that's going into, you know, what our needs are across the district from uh, our staff and the buildings uh, on up. So thank you. Thanks for hearing us on this. And we'll come back with, uh, you know, what this is going to look like. Yeah. Jeff, can so, I just can I just make one play uh, for the parents? So it's great and to hear from you guys, for us to hear from you, but the Board of Finance needs to hear from you. You need to go to those meetings because they say, well, no, you know, when they cut us 500000 or whatever it was, they said, well, no one was, we didn't see anybody. Nobody was there. So I know it's hard. We're all busy and trying to manage work, life, family, everything else. Um, but if you can go to the Board of Finance meetings, even it doesn't have to be the board of finance meeting where we present you can go leading up and you don't have to all go or anything like that but just so they start hearing the message um all along that would be really helpful for us as we go to sell it that the parents are supporting what we're trying to do and why we're trying to do it can i so, say one other thing yeah sure there's a what there's a part of the board of finance when they review the budget that will be specifically for the board of ed and in my previous life, when I was on the board, I always went to those meetings as a, was active in the PTA. So those, because they're focused on the board, focused on the board of ed, I would suggest you find out when those are, and they, usually it's part of the their uh, their agenda. But also sometimes that gets moved. But those, that's an important time too, because they're thinking board of ed, and go and speak during uh, public comment, because I I agree. I mean a lot of those. I'm trying to think. Some of the people on the Board of Finance do have children in the school system, but it's, they sometimes just don't quite understand what we face every day or our or the teacher staff or whatever. So, yes, please, go. That's going to be more my responsibility as part of that, Jill, to, to better inform our parent community as to when these meetings are, the yeah. times, um, you know, what we're looking at or facing or what the questions are. Uh, so that, that ties in with our next topic uh, yeah. on the agenda. Okay. So, so let me just, uh, just in terms of next mm -hmm. steps. So next Monday, we, we were projecting um, a public forum 
on the budget. I'm not sure that we're ready to do a public forum. Um, I think we're ready to hear a whole bunch more back from the administrative team. And I'm not sure that the administrative team has even got enough time to put together everything that needs to be put together to have a, to, you know, to get to that point. I mean, I, yeah. so, so I think that, I think that there's still uh, considerable amount of work to be done. And we've got the time, and if we are going to, if, if, if everyone on the board is, is, you know, it seems like we're all kind of together right now on this, if, if we're all kind of saying we're, we're gonna we're gonna ask we're gonna we're gonna do it we're gonna do it differently we're gonna ask for what we really believe we need okay and in order to do that we need to make sure we see the you know the, the whole thing and then we need to share it with with our with our public um, and make sure we get good attendance for for the for our public hearing so we hear from the from from parents and teachers and everybody that, that you know where, where they, they're at with the, with the proposals that we're bringing forward and then and then we'll be in good good shape to go so we've got we've got the time but there's you know we're not we're not crunched for time yet so so I, I would think we would hold off on the public forum agreed 100% and then we can talk more yeah, you've got the steps. Yep, you've got all this, and you got the you know the structured literacy piece too, which yeah. you want to bring to the yeah, table as well, yeah. and have some dialogue okay. uh, on the side of that too. Good. Okay. So. Mm -hmm. All right. Moving on to our <coughs> second and last discussion topic: <laughs> communication ad hoc uh, committee, um, which is something we kind of just touched on. Jeff and I spent a little bit of time talking about it and Jeff went ahead and drafted up um, well, some thinking I guess around what an ad hoc committee on communication might do and this would be an ad hoc committee uh, uh, from the Board of Ed um, but it could have other other people uh, you know, it yes. would have board members some board members on it but it could it, you could have other people on it yeah. as well we want to get some other, other I'm public. Public. public yeah parents yep. actually maybe a student or two on this as well um, which I think is important. Mm -hmm. a high school yeah. student maybe a middle school or two high school students yeah so that's we already kind of are working on a list of, uh, yeah. of you know, who would like to be part of this um, so and it's one of our goals. Uh, one yep. of my goals this year, as well as the board's goal, is to increase and improve on, uh, on communication. It goes from the gamut of you know, social media uh, and our use, um, if we so choose, uh, to begin sharing out more, either through a Facebook page or I know I was talking about a Twitter. I held off on that. You know, we're going to moving in this direction first. So we need to gain input uh, and see what are going to be the best avenues. Also tying in the use of infinite campus in the parent portal so we're really trying to funnel and push right. parents to use that that portal more um, for access to you know almost everything so how do we better improve and do that uh, as well I think an app is something that would be yep. very user friendly to be honest with you something with notifications that we could yep. tie into um, infinite campus um, and see if it's something that we could, Absolutely. could utilize yep. you know the website <laughs> um, our campus has a very powerful discussion board. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's no reason why you couldn't take a lot of the stuff out there in the other world and just start to set up uh, discussion topics using the discussion forum within Infinite Campus because it's an asynch asynchronous threaded process. You could say yeah, that. It might be hard to use that. A survey. Absolutely. Yeah, you there's a, a survey to our true. community yeah. too. Definitely, to yeah. should be part of it. Of what would be, yeah, yeah. yeah. I like that. Definitely yeah. be part of it. Okay. So, <clears throat> so number three is promote the access usage and updates to the website. Um, how about we just make it user friendly? <laughs> <laughs> that would be part of it. Sure. If it's not user friendly, then some now. It yeah. Is yep. An awful website. It's it, it is it's been it's what we had before. It's, yeah, I, I it's will made say that, that, but it's got a long ways to go. So it has That's why made it's on progress. Here. You can't find anything there are some on that things, website. Yeah. Yeah, you should it have to takes click like thirty times. clicks to find a calendar. <laughs> well, there's, <laughs> and there's and items that you know we're in the process of updating. You can't find the bus routes. You can't find the school lunch calendar. It, it's yeah. an awful, awful <laughs> website to use. I was teasing our central office because I've seen the same picture of the the two boys for the oh, last. They yeah, no. but they're gone now. They're in college. I, I, I see we got new pictures. <laughs> We've changed. We do have we're, new we're, yeah. pictures, but that website <laughs> is just not a yeah. user friendly website. It it is painful to click through to find something. Yep. 
I, I was trying to find a teacher's email the other day to email my son's teacher, and it took me 15 minutes. Yeah, it shouldn't be the case. It, it was horrible. Yeah, it shouldn't it, be the case. It's, so. it's, and three should just make it. How about a, a website we can actually filter mm -hmm. through? Like, it, it, definitely. I, I know I, it's like a dead horse I've been beating for the last like 10 years, but it's it's not a parent friendly or a, a public friendly website at all. So, um, does anybody think that this is is not a good idea? I think it's a great. I think idea. it's a great idea. Okay. okay. So, so, yep. um, if you just do some thinking around this, if you have any more thoughts, pass them into Jeff. Um, I've got several um, for you. Good. Uh, yeah. This is. Which, I had, I, we this is just had, to get us going. We, we yeah. We we this met. Just and, to start. This is great. And. Um, what we should, and then think about if you'd like to be. Now we can't all be on this on I this say if you're ad hoc here, committee. You're on it. What? <laughs> <laughs> not you on it. I know. I know one person would like to be on it, and she's sitting right over there. I already, yep, I she already, already has volunteered. So excellent. Good. So um, excellent. think about if you'd like to be part well, part part of this. <laughs> um, and I think the, there's another person that's uh, not here today uh, who's going to be on it. If I yeah, and I will make sure yeah. that he's he's there. <laughs> But uh, think about think about it. Um, again, um, this committee will report. Um, will do some work, and and have reports back at almost every at every board meeting, just saying how's it going, what are you up to, and all this stuff. Probably do some sort of a major interim report, and then maybe deliver a finished product sometime. We were hoping maybe June would actually say here's some recommendations here or here's what we think should be here's and here's the priority of what should be mm -hmm. should be dealt with so so we have a kind of a time frame um, <coughs> that. now whether Excuse it me, continues please. on that's that that that's to be determined you know okay. so I think that's the idea so uh, so we'll, we'll we'll do some more tweaking on this think about if you'd like to be uh, participate we probably need at least three Three would be good on the on the on the committee, and of course the committee can always pull in other you know board members for their expertise as well. So so we don't you don't you know you know we don't. Yeah. I'm on the fence of commitment. Just yeah, because right, of the other you, things. And, yeah, that's, and yeah, that's right. And, I don't, so, and Jamie's, um, I don't I'm want you. To be yeah, pulled. you're a no. I'm a no. So um, <laughs> so that so just th just think about it, um, and uh, we'll bring we'll bring back. Um, Kind of the little charter um, yeah. for approval, and then we'll we'll, we'll commission the, uh, the the firing up of this at at, at our next meeting. Or it's great. Close there. Can I? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, we said we'd open it up to the public. Or do you are you going to open it up by going to the PTA parents that you have in your PTA meeting? I, I thought I'd turn to our or your parent, parent advisory council. That's I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Advisory council. Yeah. Are you going to? Yep. You're going to open it up to yeah. them. And then student-wise, are you going to open it up to, like, the tech clubs or I don't know like yet the kids on the students. in the media center? Yeah, I think we talk with the administration and see how to best channel. I think um, that channel. would be very wise. Um, yeah. Uh, getting <laughs> Only because to they're using it on a date. I know. Like, I know. Yep. 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 It. So it's a big Even piece. Even if you grab some elementary kids, because I know we've got some tech-savvy <coughs> elementary yeah, kids, some middle school some kids, kids, and some high school kids. Yes. We can get a bunch of different perspectives yep. on it. And we are we also having conversation with Jessica Ritter just to make sure like for guidelines and that sort of thing. Yeah. Just, I yeah. just want to put Policy. that out there too. Definitely. Yeah, we can yeah. incorporate that as we go along. Yeah. Um, you know, double checking with uh, with legal. Yeah. I think it's a great so, idea. Me too. Okay. All right. Yeah, it's a need. So, okay. So that everybody all set? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's that for our discussion action items for the evening. Uh, brings us into administration reports. Okay. Jeff. Uh, uh, the no, report nothing, other than budget? No, nothing other than we've just been focused on budget. Um, so, you know, we just had a meeting <laughs> last week. Been locked in so. the conference room. I know, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it's good. Amy, you got anything uh, else? To uh, no, I guess just, I think for me, one of the things that work with the administrators and trying to think about the budget and think about the teachers is I think that we know the sense of urgency around many different topics that we know that we want to work with teachers and each other on. And we want to move in the district it's more of the change theory of how much can you evolve and provoke at one time mm -hmm. so I think that's one of the things we always toy with of knowing a sense of urgency in something and then what can we do effectively what can we manage effectively and what can we move so that it's really an efficient use and support of our students time as well as staff's time so that's something we continue to go back and forth on as we do budget deliberations to think 
what are these asks? What does that look like at implementation? What is the overall impact? And making sure we're getting the largest effect size, if you will, for our students with what it is that we're doing. So thank you for your support and your questions. We look forward to giving you more information. I'm happy to say I have most of the information that you're asking for, which is good. good. Um, That's good. So it means it's been part of the decision making, but thank you. Good. Can I ask a question? Yeah, yes. sure. How are your walks doing? So my walks are good, actually. It's interesting because I had like a 45 minutes today and I was able to go to, down to Coastal. Oh, oh nice. cool. And that good. was really fun it for me to was. go down there because I actually was watching, I'm gonna be having the math teacher at Coastal, Miss <coughs> Bass, who I don't wanna put in the spotlight, but she has invested a lot of time on ProWise training. So that's one of the things that I was going, I'm meeting with the math CIL at the high school as well as I was going to bring the elementary admin that she is looking to assist teachers cool. in their ProWise implementation as a colleague. So I got to actually see the classroom using the ProWise board, interactive lessons, kids responding, doing the math lessons, them working on a device and showing it on the board. So Good. that was a really neat, it was, it was time for me to get down there. I was happy to go down there. So. Okay. Good. Yeah. One, one quick add, just to put it out there, this uh, next year's district calendar, um, as Jim, you brought it up earlier, and some parents are asking, usually this this is the month we bring that forward. So we are planning on bringing that forward at the end of the month or at the latest, early February. Because uh, we had a couple thoughts and tweaks. The PDAC committee had uh, reviewed it uh, extensively. They did. So, which is their charge and their job. They did a good job. So we're going to kind of bring two different scenarios, two different calendars forward. Uh, yep. Are we going to so. do the two-year calendar? Um, we didn't put that on the table for right now just because we've got some other thoughts and changes. So we thought we'd start with those. Yes, well, we start with wanting to do that. And then we get into a conversation yeah, and realize that, that, that the one year I know. is a little bit of a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> so We've got to get grounded in a couple of things first. Okay. Uh, Marianne, anything else to add? No? Okay. okay. Uh, committee reports. Um, Let's see. We haven't. Well, oh, there wasn't any. There weren't any committees. No committees today. Mm -hmm. So I think we're all good at that. And uh, if I can, we have Salem next. Yeah, we do have. Yeah, we do have the Salem uh, co-op at our next meeting. Our next meeting. Yeah. Next week. Next Monday. Next, next, Monday. next Monday. Yeah. That's the whole. Yeah. Board. The yep. Salem board will be here. Okay. Okay. Yep. So. Good. so that brings us to future uh, agenda items and board comments. Any comments from the board? Jamie. I, oops, I, I, have I saw Jamie's <laughs> hand because my head was turned. I have two. Go ahead. One. We need to get a policy meeting scheduled. Mm -hmm. Yeah, got a couple. Yep, got a list. Yep, we got, got a, a list. Got, I've, got changes. A, I've got a personal yeah. policy. Yep, um, it's on the list. Pers personal <laughs> policy. I've got a personal <laughs> policy. That sounds enticing. Oh, it's so exciting. <laughs> <laughs> and then two, <laughs> for those who don't know, the Miracle League is having a meeting tomorrow night where we are actually voting to go out to bid oh, good. for contractors oh, for the nice. field. Congratulations. We finally got enough money to go out to bid, so we're Good very video. excited. But if anybody wants to volunteer, we are still looking for people. That's great. But we're really excited tomorrow night. We're having a meeting for that. Where do they so hold the would, meeting? We meet at the uh, park and rec room, like mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. the playroom. Yep. Um, and it's at 7 o'clock. But we usually meet the first Thursday, but this is a special meeting because mm -hmm. we just got all of our money scheduled and our Good. documents in. So we're having a meeting tomorrow night to vote to go out to bid and get our contractors. That's so exciting. It's very exciting. We've worked really, really hard. Yeah. We've had a great community support behind us. So thank you. Yeah, the middle school actually. They're working on a fundraiser. We've, yeah, coming up. Yep. We've been working really hard. And Good we're stuff. really excited. Candace, did you? I do. Well, first, I want to thank um, everyone that came here to speak tonight. I know that it is very difficult to come in and stand up at that podium. Mm -hmm. And yes, specifically <laughs> when you're talking about something very personal, um, certainly touched a, a personal uh, page out of the Carlson's book for uh, literacy and struggles. So I, I thank you. I want you to know that I'm listening. Number two, the structured literacy um, reading recovery, we talked a little bit about it, that we're going to have discussion about it. I just want to make sure that um, yep. it's written. Um, I would love to hear if Margie Tallinn uh, would like to come to visit our district. If she's willing to come in, I'm willing to listen. Um, and I'd like to learn about the Wilson training. Mm -hmm. The last thing is tours for the middle school and maybe
maybe the high school, we can try to do that yeah. with a collaborative with yep. the Board of Finance. <clears throat> and certainly we have a lot on her agenda. But, you know, it might be something that if we can try to get scheduled um, specifically before budget time, I think that it is very important for people to really understand how we run and how our classrooms look and, and our teachers and our students and how we, we learn here. So I think it would be good for them to see. All in favor, absolutely. I know our staff would love to have uh, I know they would. this come through. So we'll, we'll work on a date. Good. Good. Jill and Bill. Oh, go ahead. Which I just wanted to say thank you for everyone on the staff and the parents also for explaining to us in greater detail. So at least for me to have a better understanding of who the math coaches and the literacy coaches are. I know those are two important, but like tier one, tier two, tier three. Yeah, I never really knew what that was. So thank you so much for being, I'm going to say, patient with me because I didn't understand. I'm not an educator. So thank you, everyone. I really, especially the administrators for explaining that there's so many things we don't know that you do that we wish we did but mm -hmm. we don't so thank you for taking the time to explain that it's appreciated very very much Bill uh, I thank folks for speaking tonight but I wanted to comment on something that Barry presented um, I've been teaching with technology in my classroom for over 20 years and every year I find a new way to use the technology to speed up some learning process or some something wow. I'm trying to get across. And there's no doubt that whether we do it perfectly right and we lay it out, we got to get there, we need the technology, no doubt about it. One, one of the things that I, you know, whether it's a future agenda item or something I'm just, that I, I um, that Barry mentioned was that, that students ability to um, decipher valuable information from other information and, and uh, that whole piece of the puzzle I find intriguing because they, they grew up with this technology, they live with this technology, yet they're not as good at doing a search mm -hmm. on a Google search as most older generation <laughs> folks are and I wonder I what Google that search. is <laughs> you know well I, yeah, I think there's it. more to it and I think that there's there's and that's a skill that we want them and it also ties in with the, the skill of of being what makes the better learner the person who's digging and finding that information and, and moving forward and I and I think that that's something that um, as we get this technology in here it is certainly a skill that we want our students to have because mm -hmm. um, it's shocking sometimes you know when when you I'm like the information's right there at your fingertips guys <laughs> all you got to do is ask or look and they and they don't know how to find it so. on that point a later discussion item about Sam Weinberg when he wrote the Stanford report has some really good suggestions for how schools can address that mm -hmm. and it's basically complicit on the schools that we are the way we set that up the searches the students are not getting the experience in sorting through um, different sources of information good he's got some good suggestions on how to address that any any anyone else have any comments Eric just I just want to clarify next Monday so we have Salem from six to seven it's fish yeah. yeah, and then and then we will have. A and then we're going to just do a review budget review of the latest. Such. We're not. Right. It's hearing. not a full. No, we won't do a public hearing now. I don't think we're ready. Okay, but we're not doing. Are we doing a full board meeting? It'll be a. It'll all, be a. All the topics, or it will be a. Well, actually, it's scheduled as a special meeting yeah. right now. So we're just going to do the budget. But, scheduled. Yeah, it was it was scheduled exactly. already. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we will have a board meeting. But the topic is really going to be, be budget. budget. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. As a future yeah. agenda item, can we add um, the board of finance reps? Okay. Yeah, we got to get yeah, back. Gotta, I'm yeah. going to reach out to yeah. Camille as well. We need to get we, those yeah, she's on my list for this week. Yeah. We have well, we're not sure exactly, exactly what I. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. we, yeah. I think that's been good for us the last years. Agreed. Two years that we've yeah. done been doing it. I think yep. it's been good. Yeah. And now that we're in a new year, new schedules are out. We've got to get that yep. calendar back yeah. up. Yep. So okay. I'm going to reach out to her and talk with her Anybody about else? the structure. Anybody else, Barry? 
Oh. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, uh, public comment. Anybody want to address the board on any matter? Sure. Quickly. Oh, Jamie, go. Tim's getting frisky. So, first of all, I just want to applaud you guys for trying to go all in and smaller class sizes. I was here when you guys made that chart and trying to hold it to it. So I really appreciate you um, bringing it up and I'll definitely share with people that we have to go to the Board of Finance. I know we always wait until the last minute when it's like, ah, and we all show up at the middle school. Um, <laughs> but we have to start it earlier. Um, and the math, you know, making sure that we have people that are doing what they're doing in the school same as they are for literacy, but I have to say literacy is the key to everything. They can't reason the math problems and write their reasoning if they don't know how to do it. They can't read the word problems. Um, and as far as the woman from Reading Recovery coming, I so appreciate you um, making that trip. And I want to highlight that she's also Wilson certified. So for the 20% yeah. of kids who might be dyslexic that get put in Reading Recovery, she'd be able to say, this isn't the program for you. I need to do something different for this kid instead of waste 20 weeks doing Reading Recovery where a kid my daughter looked like she was reading, but she was probably guessing. She was oh, predicting yeah. and doing no, it's, this. It's not a waste. They never make the same uh, well, ever you're right. again. It's not a waste. But there are more efficient interventions for right. those 20% of kids. So I do think that um, I'm saddened to see that as one of the um, possible funding sources is taking out a reading recovery teacher without putting anything equivalent in there. I don't think that our district can afford to lose reading support. Mm -hmm. If anything, I think that the reading recovery teachers need to be trained in something additional, or we need to be screening for dyslexia in kindergarten, like the state legislation says, so that the kids, when they get to first grade, they get the appropriate interventions, or they're intervened with in kindergarten. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, I cry when I think of the years lost that my daughter had because I didn't fight for more in kindergarten yeah. or preschool. Mm -hmm. So I really think you can't take away any more, you know, if you want to present to the Board of Finance that we're keeping everything, you can't take more reading supports because there are kids who benefit from reading recovery, but not all kids benefit mm -hmm. from reading recovery. Mm -hmm. Good. So um, there are a million things that I put down, global language. I, I don't think, my daughter's in middle school and unfortunately she can't take a music, she cannot take a world language, she has to spend an hour, maybe more, doing reading interventions that she might not be doing right now if she had gotten them early. earlier on. So I don't think that if you're going to put 1.5 global language teachers, you have to keep 1.5 reading teachers in or put it <coughs> math support, train your special education teachers in Wharton, Gillingham, and Wilson, because we have kids who are working with special education teachers who don't have the appropriate training to actually deliver the services that they need. So you have to put that funding there. It's, it's, it's legal. You're going to find yourself with students who are outplaced and you're at your cost. Mm -hmm. yep. Legal fees. Mm -hmm. um, so really, I, I don't want to say take away reading recovery or any of that. There's just a lot that can be done to help a lot of kids in the district. Good. So, but I applaud math, Good. everything. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you, Jamie. Jamie. Anybody else want to address the board? Anybody else? No? Okay, with that. I would like to make a motion to adjourn. I'll I second, like second it. <laughs> All right. said, Jill's second. Like Jill, Jill said, I thought it was I'm Amy tired. said it. Said second. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor? Yes. All right. I know adjourned. my place. <laughs>